Good evening. Welcome to the spring session of the uh, Winchester Town Meeting. Uh, we uh, have reset our V Voter Quorum screen. So if I could ask everybody who is a town meeting member and is logged into V Voter, if you could now please vote present uh, so we could record our uh, quorum again. We had 119 people logged in. The quorum call will be open for five minutes. If everyone could please log into V Voter and vote present for the quorum. Thank you very much. Here we go. Thank you very much. We have 144 members of the town meeting logged in this evening. Uh, on Friday, uh, Governor Baker at 530 in the evening signed a bill authorizing the town of Winchester and other communities to conduct their town meetings uh, remotely uh, as we are doing this evening. So uh, thanks to uh, Senator Lewis and Representative Day, um, and especially our council at, at uh, Anderson Krieger, Mina Macorius, Art Krieger um, have done a great job for us in making sure that that legislation moved through. Um, so we are now uh, fully authorized to proceed as we are doing, uh, and we appreciate everybody's assistance. Uh, this has taken a lot of work from our town clerk, Marilyn Lannon, who's been great in getting us all ready to do this, uh, and our friends at Options Technology, who've been uh, exceptionally good in helping us put in place the V-Voter platform uh, and are here working with us tonight. And as always, uh, thanks to our friends at WinCam uh, for broadcasting this evening. Um, so we, uh, we look forward to this evening. We will start the town meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance, placing our right hand over our hearts. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Um, we uh, meet this evening uh, in the midst of uh, a public health emergency and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that has affected all of us. Um, and seven members of our community have lost their lives uh, to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, and people throughout the town have relatives and others uh, who've been affected by this. Um, we appreciate all the great work that the town has been doing and the Department of Public Health, um, and especially the local vendors and shops at Winchester who have been reminding us all to wear masks as we proceed through the town. Um, I would again ask people um, to focus on that as they walk through town. Um, wearing the mask is uh, not a sign of your political affiliation or your endorsement of uh, one uh, agency or another. It's uh, simply a sign of courtesy and respect to others, um, something that uh, is inculcated in all of us who are residents of the town. So um, if we could continue to display that courtesy and respect uh, and wear a mask when we were in public, uh, I know all of us would appreciate it. Um, we have, um, in the last uh, week, uh, been faced not only with the public health emergency, um, but the national moral emergency um, in which it has become evident to us um, through the death of Mr. Floyd uh, and the videotape of that death, uh, that the enforcement of the laws in the United States continue to be carried out in many instances on the basis of race. Um, this is something that is inconsistent with everything all of us believe in uh, and inconsistent with with all of the leaders of the town. Uh, I would uh, direct your attention to the statement put out by the town of Winchester and the social network um, in strongly condemning those actions. Um, I think all of us feel that strongly individually, 
Um, but we, in addition to our individual thoughts and our concerns with acting correctly ourselves and carrying out our lives with openness towards everybody, um, we are now at a point in our country where uh, we need to do something more uh, than be concerned with how it affects us or how we feel. Um, it's clear that it's time in our country, uh, in our state, and in our town that we start to take concrete actions uh, to improve the way in which uh, we treat our brothers and sisters um, and the way that we enforce the laws um, so that we're not continually reminded of the ways in which we fall short uh, in the great experiment of treating everybody as equals um, and start to take concrete steps that we can take um, to make our communities, our state, and our country uh, a place where we no longer enforce our laws, conduct our business, or otherwise judge people by the color of their skin. Um, and if you could all just join me in a moment of silence uh, for those we've lost to the pandemic, um, and for Mr. Floyd, uh, and for all who have been affected by the racism that has infected our society. Thank you all very much. Um, I'd also like to uh, extend my congratulations to the graduates of Winchester High School uh, and all the graduates in town. Um, as we uh, begin our meeting this evening, uh, a couple of procedural points. Um, as was noted in a letter sent out by the town clerk and myself um, tonight, if you want to raise a point of order, um, you can do so by typing the word order into the chat function. Um, if at the conclusion of any vote, you don't see your vote recorded and wish to record your vote by voice, you can do so by typing the words voice into the uh, Q&A function. You should also have in the email that was sent out by the town clerk um, and her uh, attached letter, um, the number of all the various helplines that are available this evening and that will assist us uh, in carrying out the meeting. Uh, the first thing um, that we have to do this evening is to adopt uh, the preliminary motions in your motion book. Um, the page one of the motion book in front of you um, are the uh, preliminary motions, uh, those that we uh, usually take. Um, they include the designation of a deputy moderator. Our friend uh, Tom Howley has agreed to serve that role this evening, uh, and he is present with us here in the studio, and we appreciate Tom's assistance. So under the preliminary motions, um, it's moved and seconded that in light of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the federal, state, and local advisories to practice social distancing, avoid the congregation of crowds, that the, the 2020 annual town meeting be heard through remote participation using a video conferencing platform and electronic voting as proposed by the moderator and his request to the select board date of May 22nd, 2020 that the deputy moderator in this instance uh, be appointed to assist the moderator in the conduct of the meeting, which would be Mr. Howley, um, and that items number three and four are as set forth uh, in the motion booklet on page one. Um, so moved and seconded that the preliminary motions be adopted by the town meeting. Um, if you could now uh, go to your V voter screen uh, and vote yes to uh, adopt the uh, preliminary motions. We'll see how that works. Uh, give, give us just one moment to uh, reset that. Still be seeing a roll call. We're just going to reset that now to adopt the preliminary motions. So our, our vote to approve the preliminary motions on V voter will have uh, two minutes to uh, conduct the vote. Oh. 
just started voting now. Okay, uh, looks like sufficient number of people having voted. We'll close the voting on the preliminary motions. 161 of you have voted. Great, 161 in favor, none against. It's gonna be a long night if you are all against the preliminary motions. Okay, so the next item on our agenda this evening is the consent agenda. This is something new for us and that we have uh, tried to explain a little bit in advance. It's something that is part of Robert's Rules of Order, and it's also in place in a number of other town meetings in our community. Um, our town council has repeatedly recommended to us in the past, and faced with the pandemic, we've finally agreed to that. So tonight on the consent agenda, we will be asking the members of the town meeting to vote on a group of motions uh, together. And these are motions that we don't expect and are not usually the subject of much debate. They would be article one to accept the reports, articles three and four, which are being indefinitely postponed, articles seven and eight. Seven is to uh, adjust the uh, budget by transferring certain funds, a uh, administerial act by the finance committee. Similarly, eight is just the allocation of the money to the uh, public access grant for uh, WinCam. 12 is the uh, allocation of funds for the lead pipe service waterline replacement that we have been doing for quite a number of years now. Um, 13 is uh, returning the surplus from capital building stabilization funds projects back to those funds. Um, 17 is uh, the capital building stabilization fund allocation. Uh, 19 is a revolving fund allocation, recreation and the like that we do every year. Uh, 20 authorizes us to borrow funds from time to time. 21 accepts the state highway funds and 22 appropriates $350,000 to the other post-employment benefit fund. These are all things that are relatively routine for us and we thought belonged in the consent agenda. The moderator um, and any five members of the uh, town meeting can remove something from the consent agenda. The consent agenda is an up or down vote on these articles um, and otherwise there is no debate. So if there is anything in the articles and they are uh, in the table of contents, each consent agenda item is marked with an X in the motion booklet. So if there's anything that people want to take out of uh, the consent agenda, um, they can do so. Um, the, if you wanna take something out of the consent agenda, <clears throat> you should um, raise your hand to do so on the Zoom function and we will recognize you um, for that purpose. If you're not raising your hand to take something off the consent agenda, um, please, uh, turn your signal off. Um, so we need five people to take something out of the consent agenda. Um, and right now we have um, one person who um, wants to be recognized. Um, articles three and four, I should be clear, are just being indefinitely postponed. Um, so the on three and four, we're not taking any substantive action there. We are just endorsing their indefinite postponement 
Um, so on one, this is just to accept the reports, which uh, are all on file with on the uh, town website, albeit a little belatedly, for which um, I apologize. Um, I have told the proponents there to the extent that their reports are substantive to the presentations they're making in the budget, that the chair will afford them the opportunity to present that information uh, at the time of the budget. Um, Three and four, uh, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Biller um, have agreed to indefinitely postpone those uh, earning the chair's undying gratitude. Um, the others, I think I have explained accurately, although apparently misstated um, Article 18, uh, which is an appropriation of $30,000 to fix a boiler. Um, so, seeing not more than one person's hand raised to remove anything um, from the uh, from the agenda. We'll now take a vote on the consent agenda. So this is on the consent agenda. There's no debate on the consent agenda. Um, it's a uh, two thirds vote because a number of these items are fund items that require a two thirds threshold. So on the consent agenda, we'll now open the balloting to approve the consent agenda. The voting will be open for two minutes. Please go to V Voter uh, and record your vote. Thank you. So my uh, effort to uh, encourage you not to use the chat except to raise a point of order is not going great, but uh, so far, <laughs> at least uh, pretty well. So please try and stay off chat. With respect to Article 4, it was being indefinitely postponed at the request of the chair. Um, and even though that's a little ironic since we're in the midst of um, our first experiment in technology, but we look forward to um, the Article 4 presentation being made by Mr. Miller and Mr. Nakamoto um, at our fall town meeting. Um, but please uh, try not to use the chat function except to raise a point of order. Um, so um, we this brings us to um, Article yeah, closing the vote on Article 1, the consent agenda. Um, on the consent agenda, 158 having voted in the affirmative, none having voted in the negative, uh, the motion passes. Uh, thank you very much. I should note um, that while there is an abstain function on the voting that when we calculate two thirds, it'll be just yeses and noes, uh, just as we do as we've met in person. Um, and could someone please elevate Mr. Mercorius, the panelist? Look like he might've had a question.
So we're just trying to get our town council uh, onto the screen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, two quick things. I, I believe you may have said that this was um, action on Article 1, just to clarify, it was action on several articles, all of the consent agenda articles. And um, that, was, that was the only reason for my point of order. So sorry to take away the time we saved. Not a problem. We, we saved quite a lot, and we appreciate your recommendation. Just to clarify, it was action on Articles one, three, four, seven, eight, twelve, thirteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, and twenty-two. Um, we did go over those in uh, detail, but we appreciate that reminder. Um, and we are now moving on to the consent agenda having passed and those articles having been adopted by the town meeting. We'll now move on to our first uh, substantive article, which is on page three of the motion book. And on page three of the motion book, it's moved and seconded that the property at Nine Meadowcroft Road be included in the Rangeley Park Historic District and the map of the Rangeley Park Heritage District be amended as shown in the map printed in the warrant. On page three, the proponent uh, of the motion and on behalf of proponents, uh, Sarah Coombs, if we could give Ms. Coombs a screen. Ms. Coombs, thank Hi. you very much. Hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Sarah Comis and I'm speaking on behalf of the commission to present the bylaw amending the Rangeley Park District map. So the owners of Nine Meadowcroft Road have signed a form asking that their property be included in the Rangeley Park Heritage District. As you can recall, five years ago in 2015, town meeting approved the Heritage District bylaw and the creation of the Rangeley Park District. So at the beginning of this year, the Rangeley Park Heritage District Commission met and we voted to recommend to town meeting the inclusion of nine meadow crops to the district as indicated on the map. Please vote yes on this warrant article. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have, have someone go move the microphone. I've solicited from the uh, town meeting member, from the select board and the finance committee, uh, their recommendations on each article. Uh, the select board has voted a favorable action on this, and uh, FinCom, uh, I believe, to the extent they voted on this. Uh, voted favorably as well. I don't have any negative votes uh, on this. Um, Ms. Von Mehring from the planning board, maybe you could just uh, confirm the planning board's uh, endorsement of this article. The planning board voted unanimously in support of this article, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this brings us to the vote on Article 2, majority vote required. Please log into V Voter and vote on Article 2. Um, the voting is now open. Takes a minute for this to come up. Balloting is now open on Article 2.
We are now uh, closing the balloting uh, on Article 2, 152 having voted in the affirmative, one having voted in the negative, majority vote required, Article 2 passes. Um, so that went pretty well, except I apologize. I should have um, been a little bit more attentive to um, the uh, debate. Um, so there were a few legacy hands raised there. Um, please accept my apologies. Um, if you've raised your hand in the past on something and that has now come and gone, if you could um, take your hand down, if that's possible, that would be great. So Article 3 was indefinitely postponed. Article 4 was indefinitely postponed as part of the consent agenda. This brings us to Article 5. Article 5 is a set forth on pages 6, 7, and 8 of the warrant book. It's moved and seconded. The town approve Article 5 as printed in the warrant. The information is set out in pages 6, 7, and 8 of the motion book. I apologize for misspeaking. Uh, on behalf of the proponents on uh, Article 5, the select board, uh, Mr. Uh, Betancourt. So uh, I misspoke there. Uh, Mr. Macorius, town council, and Beth Rudolph, the town engineer, uh, are going to speak to uh, Article 5. Uh, Mr. Macorius. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I believe um, Ms. Rudolph and I prepared a, a short pre tape presentation, which will be shown. Um, I'd be happy if my portion of it was spared because I'm sure it's not going to come off well. But Miss Rudolph's was useful. Um, it the basic point here is that the last year at town meeting, the MBTA requested that the town authorize be authorized to grant easements in connection with the Winchester Center project. Um, there were as as the plans progressed and were finalized, largely in uh, in connection with comments from and input from the town and town staff, um, additional areas were needed uh, to for the work that they're doing, both as temporary and permanent easements. And therefore, we um, are coming back before town meeting requesting uh, another authorization for the same purpose, uh, but this time capturing those additional um, portions of the property. I believe the video describes where exactly that is, um, uh, but I've, I think I've now told you the purpose of it. The maps also show where that is, so if, if you prefer, we can probably dispense with that unless Ms. Rudolph has anything else to add. I think we have the presentation on video, so we'll display that now for the uh, town meeting members. Good evening, Mr. Moderator and town meeting members. Thank you for having me. My name is Beth Rudolph and I am the town engineer. I will be presenting Article 5 this evening with Town Council Mina Macarius. This article deals with the granting of temporary and permanent easements by the town to the MBTA for the purposes of reconstructing the town center commuter rail station. Next slide, please. 
I will start the presentation by providing a brief overview of the current project design. As you may be aware, the town has been working with the MBTA on the plans for this renovation for almost 10 years. The design has gone through many, many iterations over the years and the plan on the screen shows the most recent version. The overall station layout runs between Quill Rotary to the north and the Aberzona and Waterfield parking lots to the south. On the inbound side, the MBTA will be reconstructing the ramp along Laraway Road in approximately the same location as the existing ramp with modifications to meet the current ADA requirements. A new stair will also be added along Laraway Road between the ramp and Waterfield Road. At the southern end of the station, a new set of stairs and an elevator will be added on the Waterfield lot side. The existing Chamber of Commerce building will remain. On the outbound side, the MBTA is adding a new stair and elevator at Quill Rotary in the area behind the buildings on Thompson Street. The platform will no longer stretch over the Rotary to Shore Road, as was shown in the previous design. At the, end, at the southern end, the MBTA will add a new stair and elevator at the Aberzona lot and will be adding a new ramp further south in the lot as well. The MBTA expects the project to be advertised for construction later this summer with construction to start in late 2020 or early 2021. The MBTA has decided to close the station for the duration of construction, which is expected to last 28 months. And with that, I will turn it over to Mina to provide additional information on the temporary and permanent easements. Thank you. My name is Mina Macarius from Anderson and Krieger, Town Council uh, for the town. Um, as Beth mentioned, the easements being asked for today are a result of revised plans by the MBTA. Uh, you may recall at last spring's town meeting, the MBTA uh, had asked the town to uh, grant easements for this project and town meeting voted to authorize the select board to grant those easements. It's a requirement of state law that town meeting authorize a grant of easements by the select board. Um, the change in plans, uh, as Beth described, is largely um, in involves changes to the use of the Aberjona lot and the ch changes in the easement plans are fairly minor, but since some of the areas in which the T needs easements are outside of those for which um, the town meeting authorized the select board to grant easements last year, we needed to do this uh, second vote this year. So Article 5 would give the select board the necessary authority to convey these easements to the MBTA. Uh, you'll see in the following slide some of the places where the easements are. They haven't differed. Uh, significantly, uh, the good news is that the T is is very far along now in its plans, and these are not likely to change. They also uh, the the hope is that perhaps less space is actually necessary, uh, but this gives the board some flexibility um, to issue those easements. Of course, they will be issued in public meetings, um, and after the board is sufficiently satisfied with the terms of agreements uh, regarding maintenance construction. Um, and use of the easement with the MBTA. Um, so uh, just to quickly show that the this slide uh, labeled easement plans shows the general location of all the easements. The color scheme is just to be able to distinguish one from another. Um, they do not um, actually uh, have a distinction between one, one or another. And the following slide, uh, shows the location of some of the easements that might be necessary in the rotary area where footings for the MBTA's um, uh, the MBTA line goes. Um, and so with that, Beth, I'll turn it back over to you if you have any other comments on, on the easements themselves. Um, just to, if you could go back to the previous slide, there are um, three uh, permanent easements. Um, one is along Laraway Road, one is in the Waterfield lot, another one is in the Aberzona lot. Sorry, there's four. There's actually another one along um, within the road of um, at the Rotary for Church Street. Um, and the remainder of the easements shown on here are temporary easements. And with that, I think our presentation is concluded. Thank you. Matt, can we turn off your screen?
screen there. Thank you very much. Um, that seemed to go well. Thank you very much, Ms. Rudolph. It's curious. Uh, uh, this is a article brought by the select board uh, and they have, uh, of course, uh, endorsed it. Um, FinCom has not taken an action on that. Uh, so further on the question under article five, two thirds vote required. Sure, um, if we could uh, recognize uh, Sally Dale, uh, who has a question on Article 5. Ms. Dale. My, my questions relate to the negotiations that need to be done between Winchester and the T to ensure that Winchester gets what it needs realistically from them for giving these temporary and permanent easements. In particular, I'm interested in understanding uh, specifically about the streetscaping for the town and the maintenance for the station with regards to the streetscaping and particularly with regards to the mature plantings that are within the easements or very close to the easements, the tree, very large trees on Laraway Road, the beautiful plantings on Quill Rotary, and the nature and quality of the materials that are to be used for the streetscape, which is where the MBTA and the Winchester public realm meet. I'd like to make sure that all of those things are considered in the select board's negotiations with the T as they finalize this um, important next step. Thank you, Ms. Dale. In response to the town meeting member's question about uh, what the town's receiving and especially uh, maintenance of the area uh, and the preservation of the streetscape and landscaping. Uh, Mr. McCorius, town council. Um, if others have, have more to add, I will say that the negotiation of the easements um, will include negotiation of who maintains all improvements to the property. It can certainly include um, language regarding maintenance of the um, landscaping, streetscaping, et cetera, just to keep in mind that obviously a, a large portion of the project is going to exist on the MBTA's own property. So to the extent that that's happening, that is not something that will be captured in an easement from the town. Thank you, Mr. McCorius. Further on the question, uh, Brian McCarthy, Mr. McCarthy. And Mr. Moderator, thank you very much. Uh, in looking at the picture at the Waterfield lot, um, the traffic flow currently goes through, um, when you're leaving the lot, the uh, construction easement area that's going to be granted. How is that going to flow for the parking that's going to remain? Response to the town meeting member's question, uh, either Ms. Rudolph or Mr. McCorius, with respect to the traffic flow uh, following the grant of the easement and during the construction period. Beth? Hi, this is Beth. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so they will be maintaining fire access through um, the lower entrance that's closest to the station so that fire vehicles can continue to um, get in and service the rear of the buildings on um, Church Street. And we'll be working with them to, to work to figure out the circulation for the remainder of the vehicles through that lot um, during the temporary occupation of that space. Thank you, Ms. Rudolph. Uh, further on the question, uh, town meeting member Colin Simpson, Mr. Simpson. Yes, thank you very much. I, I see that the, uh, the easement includes uh, the uh, rotary uh, as well as the circle underneath the, uh, uh, the, the tracks. Will there ever be a time uh, under this easement that the traffic circle will not be available for traffic? The town meeting member's question is whether during the construction and easement period, will there be any period during which the traffic circle, known to many of us as a rotary, uh, will not be available um, during the uh, construction or after the grant of the easement? Uh, Ms. Rudolph? Thank you. Um, so the MBTA is building on the inbound side of the station, is building um, a platform over the rotary, and they are installing a new pier in, in the rotary, um, in the center of the rotary. Um, so 
that temporary easement is necessary for them to occupy that space during that construction. I do not expect that it'll be occupied for the full duration of construction, um, and we'll have to work with them and the police to determine um, reasonable traffic um, safety to make sure that there's no impacts to pedestrians or vehicles. So I can't say how long it would be closed, but I would expect that there'll be some portion that will have probably some, at least some portion of the roadway closed during construction. Thank you, Ms. Rudolph. Further in the question, Roger Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my question is about the temporary easement on the Abbott Jonah side, uh, uh, which uh, provides access to Ginn Field as well as uh, the uh, balance of parking spaces in that lot. Uh, and is, is that going to uh, be blocked off for the whole time of construction? Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, Ms. Rudolph, will the uh, access to Ginn Field uh, available to us through that lot be uh, blocked off during the construction period? No, the, um, the temporary easement we configured so we can allow vehicles to throw, flow through the, the first part of the lot to access the rear and access Ginn Field. Thank, Thank you. you. Further on the question, um, Ms. Bodie. Thank you. Will negotiations uh, on this project also include any negotiation about the duration of the project, which seems quite long? Uh, I compare it to building a school. You can build a school longer than it will take to complete this project in a, in a shorter time, I should say. The town meeting member's question goes to the duration of the construction period, and she notes its length in comparison to the construction of school buildings at which she's most expert being the superintendent of schools in Arlington and having served us as a school committee member for many years. Uh, Ms. Rudolph, about the length of the construction period in response to uh, the Tommy member's question. Thank you. Um, so the MBTA has, has estimated that the construction will last approximately 28 months. Um, we are working with them to figure out there's ways in which we can accelerate that. This, the contractor is hired and is controlled by the MBTA, not the town. So we are not able to um, fully control construction schedule on this project. Um, however, as part of the negotiations, I think one of the things the board will consider is um, allowances for potentially night and weekend work. Obviously, there's a lot of um, considerations that go into allowing that type of work. So it'll be something that will be discussed as part of the negotiation of the easement. Thank you, Ms. Rudolph. I should have um, solicited the input of the planning board, for which I apologize. Uh, Ms. Von Mering, does the planning board have a position on Article 5? Uh, no, Mr. Moderator, we did not take a position on Article Number 5, but we did want to say that um, our appreciation to everyone who worked on this to get us to this point, and that we also really appreciate um, the 10 years of service that many members of our community have done to get us there as well. So thank you, and uh, we leave this up to the town meeting to make the decision. Thank you very much. Further in the question, Mr. McIntosh on Article 5. You get Mr. McIntosh elevated to panelists. I need to un my unmuted. There we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I'm, I'm just curious what's going on with uh, all the people like myself that use the center station. Um, are we required to somehow figure out how to get our way down to the Wedgemere station? Tommy members question is during the construction period, will the center station users be required to transit to the Wedgemere station? Ms. Rudolph. Um, the MBTA has decided to close the station for the duration of construction. Um, part of the reasoning for that was that it accelerates the overall construct construction schedule for the project. Um, so you're correct, the station will not be open to commuters during construction. Um, Wedgemere station will remain open. Um, there is obviously a, um, a pay by space parking lot at the Wedgemere station and we're currently working with the T to evaluate um, ways that we can increase parking in the area closest to the Wedgemere station as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Rudolph. Ms. Buddy, did you have a follow up or are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Further on the question, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ferrari. We elevate um, Magda Ferrari to panelist, so we can hear from her. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
I, I apologize if this is a redundant question regarding the closing of the rotary during the uh, Winchester train station closure, but I was wondering if we've considered the impact that that has at the same time of all the Eversource construction and uh, is that all going to be happening at the same time? I just fear for all those closures at the same exact time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in response to Tommy Member's question about the coordination of this construction with Eversource work going on uh, in town and other construction, uh, Ms. Rudolph, town engineer. Thank you. Um, so the Eversource construction project is currently underway and should be complete by spring of next year, I would expect, spring to summer. Um, this project will start probably in late 2020, early 2021. So there'll be a very small overlap um, between the projects I would expect. The Eversource project does not go through the town center. Um, so there's no direct overlap between the two projects. Um, and as I mentioned, I don't expect there to be a long-term closure of the rotary. Um, I think most of the work can be done with short-term closures, um, but that's something that we'll have to continue to discuss with the T and their contractor once they're selected. Very much, uh, Mr. Kelly, Paul Kelly. Elevate Mr. Kelly to panelists. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my question uh, also relates to the closing of the station and the availability of parking and uh, whether we might not, especially in the uh, rush hour periods, um, uh, impose upon the MBTA to provide uh, some kind of uh, service to get people who would otherwise uh, uh, go to the uh, Winchester Center Station to the uh, Wedgemere Station. I'm not sure there's sufficient parking down at Wedgemere to accommodate everybody, and that might be a uh, a way in the easement agreement we might be able to solve that problem. Thank you. In response to Tommy Miller's question about whether it's possible to uh, solicit from the MBTA an agreement to provide some sort of shuttle or van service or bus service between the two stations during the construction period, in response to that question, Ms. Rudolph, the town engineer. Thank you. Um, there was a discussion uh, previously with the MBTA regarding the um, installing a shuttle bus between the town center and what uh, the T deemed that to be um, out of the scope of their budget for the construction. Um, but that's certainly something the board could continue to discuss with the T if that was um, their prerogative during the easement uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Uh, further on the question, I'm not seeing. Uh, Min Kui, Mr. Kui. Min, did you have a question on Article 5? No. Thank you very much. Uh, not seeing any uh, further questions. The matter comes before the town meeting as previously uh, stated by the chair on Article 5. Uh, this is a grant of an easement town property, so it will require a two-thirds vote. Please go to the V-Voter screen now and vote on Article 5. Take us a moment to pull that up. Article 5, two-thirds vote required. All those in favor.
getting ready to close the voting in the next 30 seconds. So uh, we have 160 members having voted. If uh, we're going to close the voting in 30 seconds, if you have not yet recorded your vote. Voting is now closed on Article 5, and we will tabulate the vote. On Article 5, 156 town meeting members having voted in the affirmative, four in the negative. 160 people having voted, 156, the two-thirds threshold is met, and Article 5 passes. Before we get to Article 6, Tommy meeting member has raised a point of order. Uh, Carol Savage, Ms. Savage, what is your point of order? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think this uh, counts as a point of order. It's, um, I would like to make a motion. Um, uh, I'd like to hear the Article 23 presented, um, preferably at this time in the meeting, um, having uh, attended the town manager hearing and read the materials. I know there's some important financial implications of that article. And before we vote on other financial matters, it feels that town meeting members should hear that report. Um, and I think I have the motion correct in saying I move, we suspend the rules and consider article 23, the personnel board report um, after article five, which would be at this time. I think that needs to be seconded and voted on, correct? Yeah, so the town meeting member as a point of order has asked that we suspend the rules and take article 23 uh, out of order. Um, this is a procedural vote, which I believe is in order. I'll let Mr. Macorius uh, correct me if uh, I'm in error there, um, but it's a motion to suspend the rules and to uh, take the article out of order. No objection from me, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Mr. Macorius uh, confirms my um, hesitant uh, assumption uh, that the motion is in order. It's a procedural vote, requires a majority vote. Um, Does it need a second? It was uh, seconded by uh, Ms. Von Mehring, so it's been seconded. Uh, and then the, uh, it is uh, debatable as well. Um, so uh, this is a motion in which we would not proceed to Article 6 and would instead proceed directly to Article 23, uh, which are the personnel contracts um, before uh, we heard anything else on the warrant. Um, so uh, the procedural vote uh, to uh, take Article 23 uh, out of order. Um, matter is open for debate. Further on the question on the procedural vote, uh, Michelle Pryor, Ms. Pryor. I think this is a great idea. Thank you, Carol, for making the motion. I would love to hear the presentation and understand a bit more of the financial impacts before we vote on the full budget. Further on the question, Vote comes before the uh, town meeting on Artic on the town meeting members question to suspend the rules and take Article 23 out of order. Majority vote required. All those in favor of suspending the rules and taking Article 23 out of order, please vote yes. Those opposed, please vote no. We'll now open the balloting on that procedural motion. Please stand by.
We'll close the balloting on this at 827. Eight twenty seven, the balloting is closed on the motion to suspend the rules. Majority vote. Motion passes one hundred and thirty six in favor, nineteen against. This brings us to Article 23, which appears on page 32 of the motion book. Uh, the only thing we don't know is whether or not Mr. Scheimetz is prepared to proceed on Article 23, but I see he's logged in with us, Mr. Scheimetz. You need some time, Peter, or are you okay to go on this? Uh, I'm okay. I, I recorded the uh, presentation a, a week ago, so that would just get played, I suppose, out of order, and then I'm ready to answer the questions. Perfect, thanks, Peter. Um, so we're gonna, now gonna play Mr. Shymet's, uh presentation uh, on I, your screen. I'm probably gonna, should apologize for it right off the bat, but otherwise. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Shymets. I'm here representing the personnel board, and I'm going to be giving you a rundown of Article 23. Um, the first couple slides, let me go to the first oh, slide. Um, this is an overview of all the motions and what they pertain to. This is a very big article, very big motion. It has 16, sorry, very big article, and it has 16 motions within the article. So the first two motions are, are there to create and remove positions within town government. Um, we'll get into that and in all these in detail, but uh, those first two go together. The first one is the uh, creation removal. The second one is the money. Uh, motion three and four are together. Again, it's the same format. Uh, motion three covers a cost of living increase for the union, and uh, motion four pays for it or funds it. Uh, motion five is the ratification of the police patrolman officer's contract. Because the contract uh, comes in a couple, uh, comes in a year into the uh, contract cycle, it actually takes two motions to fund it. The first one covers the change in the uh, in how much we would have paid the police officers last year, and uh, our, and motion seven covers what we will be paying them in the coming year, and that's the same format for the next two contracts. So. Motion eight is the police superior officers contract. We'll go into all of these in de detail. Nine pays for FY20 and 10 pays for FY21. Motion 11 uh, funds is, is for ratification of the firefighters contract. 12 pays for FY20 and 13 pays for FY21. Uh, periodically, we up date the Winchester Personnel Policy Guide and Motion 14 is, uh, is, an up, is a, uh, for the town meeting to ratify those changes. And these changes actually result in some uh, um, financial effects. They have some financial results and uh, 15 funds those. And then finally, there is a, a remaining contract that uh, the cycle that has not been settled. That's the clerical workers union. And in order to deal with the possibility that that is settled in the next year, we want to make sure that we'll be able to pay for it, pay for the uh, what will be a retroactive salary in FY21 and FY21. So motion 16 raises a sum of money and puts it in the unallocated wage account for FY21 so that when, if when, we actually settle the, the clerical workers contract, we will be able to pay for it. Okay, so let's get to the motions. So motion one, as I said, it creates five positions and it eliminates one. Uh, we are uh, deleting a PT14 junior engineer and that person is being moved up to a, a PT15 senior engineer. Um, th uh, this it follows uh, an actual promotion for a, a single individual. 
PT-14 is a procurement administrator position. It doesn't exist at the moment, but the, uh, or the state procurement system has gotten so complex that people need very extensive training in order to do it. In order to um, incentivize people to actually take the training, we're adding a stipend, well, we're creating a procurement administrator and then adding a stipend for that administrator. And so that's the PT-14. Within management, we're adding two, um, two new positions, assistant town planner and a sustain, sustainability director. And finally, um, uh, we're adding a position which will end up being in the police department called a, a miscellaneous, called a risk management coordinator. And this is actually a stipend that adds on to uh, the pay that uh, the person who's going to be in this position will get. The, the personnel board recommends favorable action on Motion one. Motion two is the appropriation to pay for uh, the article uh, the, uh, the, for motion one. Now, um, there are only two positions re require actually funding. The engineering department will get uh, an additional sum of $3,359 in the police department to, co to cover the, the junior to senior engineer. The police department will get an added uh, $13,928 to cover the risk coordinator. The other positions either are not going to be funded within the present uh, fiscal year or they are already covered in the, in the um, uh, appropriations that you did in the, in the, that we passed with the yellow sheets. Um, the personnel board recommends favorable action on motion two. Motion three is a cost of living increase for the non-union personnel. This, mo this motion provides for that um, this, uh, and uh, for the year, for this coming fiscal year, uh, the town is recommending a 1.5% increase. Um, it is funded in the next uh, motion. Personnel board recommends favorable action on motion three. Motion four, again, this, this uh, is the appropriation associated with motion three, if motion four is the appropriation associated with motion three, the total cost of the article is 132,462. The funds are dispersed or distributed as shown in the written article that you have. I didn't want to repeat that here. Um, the source for the funds, depending on where it's gonna go, um, come from the tax levy for everything that is not in water and sewer or recreation, and that's 106,000 $408. All of the water and sewer uh, uh, funds come from the water and sewer retained earnings budget uh, account, and that's $4,988. And the recreation uh, expenses come from uh, the recreation retained earnings, and that's $21,066. Personnel board recommends favorable action on motion four. All right, well, now we get to the contracts. There's three of them that came in in this, uh, in this cycle. Uh, well, others have come in before. There's three of them that come in in time for this town meeting. The first one that we're gonna discuss is the Police Patrolman's Union. They are, all three contra contracts have um, roughly the same uh, overarching form. Um, there are going to be differences and we can talk about that in, in the question period. Um, what we will discuss here is, is the major elements that affect the, the actual cost of the contract. So we've, uh, we've agreed to a contract, uh, the town and the patrolman's uh, patrol officers union have agreed to a contract. The contract covers the, uh, the soon to end FY20 year, FY21, which is soon to begin July 1st, and FY22. This ends on June 30th, 2022. The new, co the new t contract um, has a number of variations within the contract, and we will focus here on just two. One of them is the, is the step change in the overall uh, base pay rate, and the other is the eligibility rules for uh, police details. So uh, last year, um, the, the police uh, get a 2% raise that covers all of uh, the year that's now coming to an end. They get a 4% raise over that year, starting January, July 1st, and starting July 1st in 2021, the start of fiscal year 22, they will get a 6% raise over FY21. 
these large steps in the in the out years are there to cover the difference between what the uh, town of Winchester pays their police and what other surrounding towns pay. As you remember, we've been, for the last number of years, we've been going out and comparing the salaries that Winchester pays to the surrounding communities, and we've been making adjustments where necessary. And we have found that the police in Winchester are actually paid substantially below uh, their surrounding communities. And we can, we can show you this information if, if you want to see, or um, it's, it's available. Now, one of, the, uh, one of the hallmarks of what the town received in return was a change in the elig eligibility rules that, uh, governing police details. Uh, previously, only uh, Winchester police officers, active Winchester police officers, were el eligible for police details within the town. And as you know, there's a tremendous amount of work going on in the town now, and it is quite difficult for the town under the old rules to get people to stand those details. So we have, we have gotten an agreement with the patrolman's union, and you'll see also with the superior officer's union, to increase the number of, increase the eligibility pool. Personnel board recommends favorable action on five. Now, this is a breakdown of the financial impact of five, and um, as you can see, that in the base salary, um, so the, the fifth line down, the base salary, this increase in the base salary, you see the 2%, it comes out to about 7.4 and then 10.73 year over year, um, with a total increase over the lifetime of the contract of 21.6%, 21.58%. Now there are a number of provisions within the contract which also have ramification, have cost ramifications, there's step increases, the benefit, there's benefits incentives, holiday pay, night differential, things like that. And together they, uh, they, ha they bring the overall effect of the cost over the three years of the project to 33 33%, uh, 33.51%. Uh, 33 um, motion six is the appropriation required to pay for FY, the, the FY20 effect. So this pays for the um, salaries that are taking place in the year that is now just coming to an end. And so we, we are appropriating $40,817 in FY20. This, uh, uh, this motion goes into the police department's personal services budget, and it comes from the FY20 unallocated wage account. Uh, the personnel board recommends favorable action on motion six. Motion seven uh, covers FY21, the upcoming year, and this is an amount of money uh, that, um, this amount of money is the, is the change this covers the change in the FY21 budget that you passed in, with the yellow sheets. Um, and this is uh, 213,618. It covers the, the step increase uh, for FY20 plus the carryover for the increase in FY20, uh, sorry, the step increase for FY21 plus the carryover for the, for the increase that we saw in FY20. Um, again, uh, this is, uh, uh, it's, this is appropriated into the police department's personal services budget from the FY21 unallocated wage account. Uh, personnel budget recommends favorable action on motion seven. A motion eight, um, now we're moving to the police superior officer contract. Unlike the fire department, the police department is split into two unions. There is the patrolman's union, and then once a, a police officer becomes a superior officer, they move into another union. Um, so this union, again, this, this contract, again, it's, it starts um, a year late in the cycle, so it has to go back and fund FY20. It, um, it again, addresses a, a shortfall in what we believe to be the difference in, in, in to payment that we give our superior officers compared to the surrounding towns. And so you have this stepwise increase, so 2% and 5% and 6% over the three years of the contract. And again, you have the eligibility rule changes in police detail. It affects this union as well. The personal board recommends favorable action on motion eight. This is uh, the financial impact of motion eight. Um, 
again, you see the, the increase in, in, in base salaries predicted over the next, uh, over the previous year, the coming year, and the final year of the contract. So 2.02%, 8.93%, and 10.58% year over year with a final base salary increase of 22.88%. And again, there are other un in incentive detail, incentives that add cost to this, including um, step increases, et cetera, which bring the overall three-year increase to 34.8%. Motion, motion 9, again, is the appropriation to FY20 for that associated with Motion 8. It's $26,480. Again, it goes into the police department's personal services budget, um, and it does come out of the FY, un FY20 unallocated wage account. Personnel board recommends favorable action on motion nine. Motion 10 uh, takes care of the changes in FY21 uh, that, are, that are associated with motion eight. Uh, for FY21, um, motion, eight, uh, motion 10 moves $153,004 to F, uh, in FY21 and it, appro it, it appropriates that amount from the FY unallocated wage account into the FY21 Police Department personal services budget. And the, pers the personnel department recommends favorable action on motion 10. So now we get to the fire department contract. Obviously the uh, eligibility rules are not, didn't come up here, but um, a change in the funding um, a change in the way we paid or how much we paid the firefighters was all was here. So again, we start second year of a three-year cycle. So again, we will have to go back and fund FY20 and then fund FY21 as, as, as separate items. Um, this contract again has an end date of June 30th, 2022. Um, the provisions in this contract have 2% increase for FY20, a 4% increase for FY21 and a 6% increase for FY22 to bring the, the uh, Winchester firefighters compensation in line with surrounding communities. It also adds uh, the, the possibility of, of a new position called either deputy chief or assistant chief to the ranks of the firefighters department. Other provisions are outlined in the article. Personnel recommends favorable action in motion 11. So this is the effect of motion 11. There, the base increases go up 2% in FY20, 8.31% uh, in FY21, and 8.17% in FY22 for a compounded increase over the three years of 19.5%, of including, all of these include the compounding effect of previous salary increases. Again, there are step increases and various and sundry other elements in the, in the um, contract which do add, pro, do add cost for an overall increase over the life of the contract as predicted to be 33.84%. Motion 13, again, we're back to paying for FY20. Um, this is, uh, we, we're appropriating $82,800 80, $82, um, to the uh, FY20 Fire Department personal services budget from the FY20 unallocated wage account. Personnel budget, personnel board recommends favorable action on motion 12. For motion 13, now we're paying for the coming fiscal year, fiscal year 21, and uh, we are appropriating 476,563. Uh, again, that goes into the FY21 uh, fire department personal services budget from the FY21 unallocated wage account to, to cover that cost. Personnel board recommends favorable action on motion 13, and that ends the motions that are related to new contracts. Uh, motion 14 takes up changes in the town's personal uh, personnel policy guide. Um, you may remember that uh, a few years back, we at the personnel board undertook a multi-year process of updating the, the personnel policy guide and putting it back into service. And with the addition of a, a funded and staffed 
HR department in Winchester, this has become a, a document that is actively um, reviewed and brought up to date. We did, we did a review of the personnel budget, uh, thanks in large measure to the comptroller and the new HR director. And um, there were numerous changes in them, of which two uh, affected, uh, that actually affected the budget. So um, those are the ones that we're going to discuss here. And in motion 14, what we are going to, uh, uh, what we are going to be passing on is a change in long longevity pay, which I'll show you in the next slide for non-union employees, and a change in the sick time buyback policy. So that there is a policy within the town that if you have in excess of 80 days of sick time available, you can buy back the, the, uh, the, those in excess um, for, with, with, the chain, with this change in policy, you'll be able to buy them, uh, uh, the town will buy them back at the rate of about $125 a day. Well, not about, exactly $125 a day. This is incre increase for those employees on, on schedules two and four from $75 a day and an increase from $50 a day for employees on Schedule 4. Um, so Motion 14, uh, this is just a continuation. This shows the change in longevity pay. Um, so for, if for employees who have worked here five years, we'll get a, blank, we'll get a, 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 a payment of uh, 1,050 rather than the previous one of 950, and you can see the numbers here. So in general, um, uh, people's got something around 200, a little less, uh, depending on which year you're looking at. Um, personnel board recommends favorable action on motion 14. Motion 15 is raising the money to pay for what we just passed in motion 14. And again, this is spread across um, all the departments uh, on the town side, and uh, we are appropriating a sum of $62,906. And the sources for that are uh, the town um, levy for $58,831. For those positions which are affected by this within the Water and Sewer Department, we are levying uh, $3,875. Uh, from the water and sewer retained earnings. And for those uh, um, positions that are in the recreation department, from the recreation retained earnings, we're, we're uh, levying two, $200. And those funds are then appropriated as shown in the article. Personnel board recommends favorable action on motion 15. And now we get to the final article of the uh, final motion of the evening. There is still a single contract, as I mentioned earlier, the clerical workers who have not settled their contract. So it is likely that when that contract is settled, there will be a retroactive clause to cover the period from FY20 to FY21. What will happen is that there'll be a contract, a new contract, probably next year, though we've seen it run more than a cycle, but there will be a new contract uh, probably next year, and we will have to cover that back pay in FY20 and FY21 when that contract is finally settled. So in order not to get caught out, what Winchester does, and this is a standard practice within Winchester, is to set aside an amount of money that Winchester estimates it will cost to pay for those back wages in FY21 and set those aside and put them in the unallocated wage account for that year. And, and um, so we will be moving a, a sum of $76,289 to the FY unallocated wage account to cover that budget. And uh, again, personnel board recommends favorable action on motion 16. And with that, I thank you for your attention and um, hopefully uh, we'll answer questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. If we could now um, elevate the panelists from the various boards so we can solicit uh, input from them. So the uh, there are 16 motions under Article 3. They are all set forth in the salmon-covered booklet titled Personnel Board Report, dated June 8th, 2020. 
um, and start on page one and go from there. The first uh, four motions um, relate to the uh, town's compensation plan, um, motions five through 10 to the police contract, 11 through 13 to the fire contract, and 14 through 16 uh, to general changes in the town's compensation plan and the clerical contract. Um, so the chair will permit debate on the motions under Article 23 uh, as a whole, um, but would ask that speakers try to address uh, the uh, contracts and the motions and the groupings that I have articulated. So uh, under Article 23, um, does the uh, select board have a recommendation? Mr. Betancourt, the chair of the select board. Mr. Betancourt. Yes, Mr. Moderator, uh, thank you. Uh, the select board uh, recommends a favorable action on um, uh, the articles uh, by a vote of four to one. Um, so um, happy to take questions on that. Um, and I'm sure other members of the board will, will speak uh, as I was the uh, dissenting vote. Uh, I don't want to present the, the position in its entirety, but happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Betancourt. May we have a recommendation from the Finance Committee, Ms. Soto. Ms. Soto. Hi, everyone. Yes, Finance Committee voted a favorable action on Article 23. Motion one, be on. Nicole, just to clarify, uh, favorable action on all 16 motions, or are you just addressing motion one? Uh, we did vote favorable action on all 16 motions, yes. Thank you. Um, and the town manager, uh, Ms. Wong, Lisa, do you have um, anything you wanted to add on the uh, motions brought under Article 23? Is Lisa muted? Yeah, we're not seeing uh, Lisa currently. Um, so uh, we will go to the uh, town meeting members um, for debate under Article 23. The chair will permit debate uh, on the 16 motions, but to the extent possible, uh, would ask that the speakers uh, address them as they've been articulated and grouped. Uh, so further on the question under Article 23, town meeting member, uh, Mr. Conti, uh, can we elevate Tony Conti, please? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm not sure if I can be heard right now, but uh, uh, I'm concerned about the, uh, the sum total of these uh, uh, proposals, um, which would appear to uh, consume the bulk of what uh, funds are left over from the override, which I understand is, is uh, something between 3.3 uh, and 3.7 million dollars over the course of the next uh, two fiscal years. Uh, the bulk of those funds are going to be consumed by these uh, contract provisions, which leads me to think that we're going to have to have another override very soon. Uh, in particular, the police and fire union uh, contract, which uh, over the uh, two-year period, excuse me, over this year plus the uh, two following fiscal years, uh, add up to uh, anywhere between 21 and 33 uh, percent increases. Now, I've never voted against a, a police or fire department uh, contract in 30 years on the uh, fine, on the uh, town meeting, but uh, this I've never seen a uh, contract that provided for uh, 21 to 33 percent uh, increases in, in uh, uh, history. And it, it, the towns, it, it strikes me that the towns that uh, have the personnel board has compared uh, Winchester to, a town, the bulk of those towns have substantial commercial property uh, tax bases, which Winchester does not have. 
you lack the, the uh, fundraising ability that uh, towns like Arlington and Lexington and uh, uh, other communities that have substantial tax, uh, commercial property tax bases, our property uh, is overwhelmingly, I think it's over something over 90% residential. And we, we lack that base. And I don't see how these, uh, all of these contract divisions are uh, financially sustainable without uh, uh, override increases every year. And uh, for that reason, I, I seriously question. Uh, I also note that one of the uh, points that was made by Mr. Shiner was that the town will gain by uh, the um, uh, reduction in, uh, in uh, uh, detail costs. However, from when I looked at the MOAs that uh, the excuse me the uh, MOA with the police union, the only the chief only has that authority after all of the uh, permanent officers have been offered uh, the details. So that that uh, it, while it may result in some savings in the future, that it, to me looks kind of problematic in that it's dependent upon officers uh, turning down the. Uh, uh, the uh, request, and then there's a priority list that uh, begin, begins with retired officers, which uh, I'm not sure if there would be any particular savings uh, if, if we went down that priority list. Uh, so I'm not sure if the savings are going to amount to anything substantial. So that's, that's, those are my concerns, and I welcome the, uh, uh, the, uh, the selectmen, uh, the chairman of the board of selectmen, and the uh, uh, members of the finance committee to comment on those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conti. Uh, further on the question, I believe uh, Lisa Wong, our town manager, uh, we have managed to locate her on the board here. If we could elevate her as a panelist. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to um, see the mute button and unmute and speak. Um, so I first want to thank everybody for the consideration of um, just about all the contracts um, over the last few years at one time or other to do a adjustment uh, based on sort of a similar uh, pattern of looking at um, comparable data from other communities. And you can see that they're different for each union uh, because we did look into specific aspects of uh, each department. Um, I do want us to understand that the decision to move forward with this is certainly looked at in financial terms, um, but this is more than a financial um, uh, commitment and contract that we have with our staff. Uh, if I look at all of the unions, the public safety unions are the last ones to have um, any significant uh, wage adjustment, which means that um, you know we've seen other uh, we've seen other unit units, we've seen uh, department heads, we've also seen non-clerical who've had wage adjustments several years ago. Uh, I felt very strongly that um, that if we are consistent, um, we need to be as consistent as possible, not just in the way that we approach uh, looking at parity among comparable towns, but also um, in time. Uh, if we were going to be comparable in time, uh, frankly, it would have had a significantly higher retroactive um, negotiations with the unions. But uh, I had set a budget um, more than six months ago, and I said, this is what the town can afford. Um, not only can we afford this, um, but we can also afford this and extend the override in our long-term projections. So uh, not only does it, you know, I did I set a budget, but I also set an additional goal of extending um, the override past the, the the two years that was discussed during um, the override campaign, uh, and um, I think I've been able to achieve multiple things at one time. So one would be um, being cognizant of the override in the finances. The second is to make sure that all of our employees feel valued and that they understand parity, not just in the approach that we take in looking at the pay analysis, but also in terms of the time that we get there. Uh, I also want to thank the unions for um, you know, really um, you know, pushing this um, into future years and also uh, going significantly below uh, what their initial requests are going to be and also making um, significant I think it's also important to note from an operational standpoint, um, you know, the, these um, uh, 
uh, you know, these, these folks in all three unions have uh, hopefully demonstrated to you their commitment to the town, uh, this, despite the pay, um, not just before COVID-19, but since then, um, I'm proud to work alongside all of these individuals. They have been um, professionals, they have been uh, cooperative, um, they've committed, um, but at the same time, um, you know, people have to make individual decisions just like each of one uh, of us does uh, when we consider what we need to do for our families. And we are losing the fight in terms of being able to attain, attract, and keep individuals. So um, I, don't, I don't think somebody says, um, you know, that town next door is going to pay me, you know, 10 or 15% higher. And, uh, you know, at the end of my career, um, some of these t towns are paying 34% higher in the top ranks of these jobs that they're going to, uh, and, and they have to join those forces early in order to achieve those top ranks. Uh, they're making these decisions now, um, and they're not saying, well, I'm going to have a 34% reduction in my pay because there is less commercial here, and that's going to offset what I need to do, um, you know, to feed and care for my family. So, uh, there was a lot of give and take and a lot of compromise in terms of, you know, not achieving the kind of parity that I see in other unions who are at average or well above average. Um, I, a lot of these unions will still remain over um, under average and it will take them three or four years to get there. So, um, again, a lot of compromise and also a lot of operational considerations in terms of the, the difficulty of the jobs. Um, and looking at the supply and demand of um, the, the types of qualities of uh, public safety workers that we want. So um, I guess I just wanna say, again, this is more than finances. Um, certainly finances were a top consideration, but it was also a consideration to keep our personnel, retain our personnel, continue to have the best personnel here serving Winchester. Thank you very much, Ms. Wong. Uh, further on the question, Carol Savage, Ms. Savage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I um, appreciate the, the information that's been given so far. Um, I, uh, uh, too, as in a town meeting member, Mr. Conti raised a number of important questions. Um, I hear and I also uh, concur that we value our town employees on um, municipal and the education uh, uh, budgets of our town, um, and we do want to attain, attract, and retain um, the best employees that we can. And what we need to do to do that is, um, is reflected in, in these negotiations, I know. I, well, I, my concern is that we do this in a way, the FinCom report made it abundantly clear that we're living in, a, in an uncertain time and has made some re recommended cuts to various parts of our budget. Um, and so I would like um, to understand from the uh, FinCom uh, and the Select Board, how do these um, increases compare to what was assumed in the override projection uh, when we built that override budget that we put before uh, the voters? And if there's a difference of opinion on the Select Board, I'd like to hear from both sides on that. The town meeting member asks uh, the finance committee to comment on how these contracts comport with any projections or estimates made at the time of the override, uh, and then asks uh, a similar set of questions from the select board. Um, in response to the FinCom question, Ms. Soto. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Carol, and I wanna make sure I give you the, the exact right answer looking at our, our three-year plan moving out at the time, because that's, as you can imagine, that's a, a document that we're always updating, and the one that we put together this year has the new numbers reflected in it. So um, I would be happy to look that up and give you specifics on that. Um, my guess is that it was budgeted based on historicals, which are definitely much less than what we're seeing here. Um, I know that I didn't go into detail first. I wasn't sure if uh, town moderator wanted us to speak more in depth, um, or if we were just talking about motion one, but um, finance committee does understand that these increases are are well outside of what we've seen historically in these departments and what you know the prop two and a half sort of allows. Um, when they come to us, the 
they've already been negotiated. Um, the MOUs have already been signed by the time we get this information typically. Um, and so that that is part of our decision making process when we vote um, favorable action on it. Um, it's just where we are in the process. And also we understand that with these three particular budgets, the two, uh, I'm sorry, MOUs on police, two on police and one on fire, that we're expecting this to be kind of a, a one-time market adjustment shot. And that after these uh, are up, and when we go to the next round of negotiations, we won't see similar increases. Um, but I can circle back to that specific question, uh, Mr. Moderator, when, when I have a chance to look at the exact numbers we used. Thank you, Ms. Soto. And just a reminder to the members of the meeting, uh, our role as a town meeting is not to negotiate these contracts uh, or to uh, get into particular numbers, but to consider the uh, negotiations that have been completed by the appropriate representatives of the town and the contract as a whole as it's been presented by us uh, in its review by uh, the Finance Committee, Select Board, and Personnel Board. Um, each of whom are recommending favorable action this evening. Further, in response to the town meeting members' question, uh, and I, it seems like, Ms. Verdicchio, you may be the appropriate uh, person to speak to the select board's uh, endorsement and favorable uh, recommendation yes. with respect to this contract. Yes, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Um, I did not crunch the numbers uh, going into the uh, override, but I was involved in that process. And I know that we talk a lot about how um, most of our unions and uh, employees were not earning at the market rate uh, among comparable communities and that we anticipated that there would be, again, like um, Ms. Soto said, a, a market adjustment in wages and salaries uh, going forward and that we were uh, trying to have the override provide for um, the needs of the town and the salary increases across the board, um, we move away from the idea that um, there's a town side and there's a school side or something like that, that we are one town and that everyone um, should have their needs provided for and that we all need to um, have um, high quality and motivated staff. Um, I would also reiterate that this is uh, this, contract, as, as Lisa mentioned, was extensively negotiated for many, many weeks with the aid of Labor Council. And um, I'm sure a full discussion was, was had. And um, that's why I, I, I really think that it's, it's premature to think that we need to um, step back from these because of the economic um, impact of the, the pandemic. Um, I, I recognize that we are in uncertain times, but I just um, I just feel it's premature to uh, sort of suddenly cut you know cut back on these these contracts. I, I really want our town to support our first responders, and that's why I think that uh, a number of us did vote um, to ratify these contracts. And I I really think this is a mistake to do this now at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Verdicchio. Further on the question, Mr. Wilson, town meeting member, uh, Roger Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Yes, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, uh, through you to the uh, uh, Finance Committee, uh, I want to understand um, when the override is projected to occur. Are we talking about an override that will apply to fiscal year uh, uh, 2022? And uh, is in uh, this contract commits uh, through fiscal year 2022, uh, but it doesn't commit the spending that the town makes. So uh, am I correct in thinking that our alternative to increasing the spending to pay for the contract is to start laying people off? And, and that will be basically the override discussion. So the uh, town meeting member's question to the finance committee is whether or not the uh, favorable vote on these contracts uh, requires either a future override vote uh, or a uh, if that is not successful, whether it will result in uh, a reduction in personnel. In response to the town meeting member's question, uh, the chairperson of the finance committee, Ms. Soto, Ms. Soto. Yeah, right now, um, our outlook is that another override 
based on everything that finance committee has voted will not be needed until FY24 at the earliest. Um, that's, you know, obviously given current project projections. So that gets us through FY, the end of FY23 with um, what's negotiated now through all of these MOUs, um, some sort of blog, I'd have to look up the exact percentage increase we have for those departments for FY23, since we don't know what those uh, contracts are gonna look like um, and without any, any layoffs. So it, it's able to, to get us through to at least FY24. Um, to the start of FY24, I should say. FY24 may need an override depending on how much free cash we're willing to use to balance that budget. Further in the question, Mr. McCarthy, Brian McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just two questions. Um, one, in the, the discussion of the um, opening up of detail work to outside parties more quickly, does that reduce overtime to the police department? Um, and then number two, could someone describe to me the, the role of the risk management quarter, coordinator that's being uh, created? In response to the time of member's question, uh, Mr. Scheimetz from the personnel board about whether the uh, change to the detail uh, procedures will act to reduce uh, overtime and following that, uh, the, the identify the uh, scope of duties with respect to the risk management coordinator, Mr. Shimetz. I'm, I'm gonna to have to ask the, uh, the police chief to answer those questions. Um, I believe, uh, I certainly believe that uh, the detail aspect or the detail part that, that does reduce costs for the details. Um, it also actually makes it possible to cover the details. For the risk coordinator, um, I think it would be much better to have the uh, police chief answer that directly. Is is he on? Otherwise, I I can relay the question to him. Uh, I am on. If you can hear me. Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Chief McDonald, in response to the uh, tummy members' question, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Relative to the uh, the new police department position as a risk coordinator, that would be working with. Um, and being a liaison for ADRM, who was the vendor who provided the risk assessment plan to the, to the town. And I would be coordinating the efforts um, with other town officials, Jay Gill, uh, Peter Lawson, and others, in order to prioritize um, a multi-year plan relative to the recommendations that were made by the Penn State of Risk Management. Relative to the second uh, town meeting member's question on details, um, the the changes to the detail policy will not will not save overtime. Um, at least insofar as the overtime we require on the police department, they're two different things: um, detail costs versus overtime costs. I, I don't know. I hope that answered your question, Mister. Um, uh, Mr. Moderator. Th thank you, Chief. We appreciate that. Further in the question, um, Mr. Golubov. Mr. Golubov. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I, um, I was in the uh, group that worked on the override with uh, former chair of the select board, Lance Grenzebach. Um, the two of us worked uh, for close to a year on the math, and um, we knew going into it that uh, for the past decade, um, the, um, especially the, the fire, um, but also the police uh, unions have not gotten the uh, increases that um, would have them uh, comparable to other departments. Um, in the three years I've been on the select board and then previously on the finance committee, we always struggled with um, the cost, especially on the fire side of, um, hiring uh, people, then uh, training them, spending all that money, and then having them leave for um, other towns or cities where they could get paid more, uh, significantly more. Um, when we did the uh, study, we were underpaying by close to 30%, depending on the position. Um, so this was um, envisioned on, as part of the override. And I, I just want to say that the town manager has done a fantastic job in being able to address uh, the, um, 
the deficiency in our, our pay to our, um, to our first responders um, that we have had and um, that this will reduce if we are able to fully staff the departments by being able to recruit and retain, um, it will also reduce uh, overtime costs. Um, and honestly, this is the right thing to do for our employees um, that put their lives on the line for us. Um, we've been uh, underpaying them for long enough. Um, and the fact that the town manager was able to negotiate these contracts, that gets them not all the way to comparable to other towns, but gets them most of the way there. Um, and to do so while also being able to extend the override beyond the original two to three years that we planned last year. And now we're looking at four to five years. Um, I, I think that's a fantastic job. and. Um, I was. Uh, I definitely recommend for town meeting to vote favorable action on uh, this article. Thank you, Mr. Galipa. Further on the question, uh, Ms. Pryor, Michelle Pryor. Thank you, um, and thanks everybody uh, for all the comments so far. I know we can't get into the details. Uh, certainly, though, I would wonder if if where we landed is thirty three percent, and that was below the initial request. I got to wonder where we started. Uh, $2.5 million after three years is the impact of the OSHA's 5 through 13 lease and fire. I won't single out one or the other. I, no one who's asking questions is saying they don't appreciate our public safety officials, our public safety staff. I agree uh, that with the town manager that we all make individual decisions. Certainly people can choose to take other jobs. I will choose to vote against all of these motions. That will be my individual decision. I think it's not premature to step back from an unsustainable contract. I understand these were negotiated before COVID, but it's a new day, and our revenues are going in the wrong direction. And we have an override that we might extend for four years, uh, but it's just a different time, and that's unfortunate. I do have two questions. One is to put back Carol Savage's question which was, if we could hear the dissenting opinion from the select board, I'd like to hear that. And my question, uh, I'm not sure to whom it should go, but I, I don't think Nicole would know it from FinCom, but has there, any been, has there been any contract in the recent past, let's go back 15 years, where the three-year impact has been in excess of 33%. Thank you, Ms. Pryor. Um, although we're we're trying to avoid the uh, voicing of uh, so-called dissenting opinions, the select board uh, is more than entitled to participate in the meeting in their individual capacities and to speak to their views on the issue. Mr. Betancourt has been patient and waiting to do so. Mr. Betancourt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, thank you, Ms. Pryor. Um, this is one of the hardest votes I've ever had to take in my time in Winchester. Um, I from a union family, so teachers, uh, police officers, electrical workers, carpenters. Um, I voted against this because I feel it's not sustainable. Um, this was, and I think it's important that we're honest, um, this was never communicated as part of our uh, override discussion. We've discussed a lot of deficiencies um, during that period of time, um, and uh, certainly uh, there was a committee that worked on that but we communicated that this override was for deferred uh, projects with, on the school side. Uh, that was the bulk of it. There was a, a couple positions on the public safety side and a couple uh, on the fire side and the capital as well. Um, it's not okay for us to continue to build beautiful buildings and invest in infrastructure and not pay and compensate our municipal employees uh, at a reasonable level, at a livable level. Uh, and I think that during a pandemic like we are in right now, I think it makes clear that um, our unions and our workers are uh, more important and more necessary than ever. Uh, um, I think this contract is the opposite of what it uh, intends. And I think that a contract that is going to be uh, reconsidered again in uh, FY22, just a year from now. Um, it's going to impact uh, all of our negotiations um, with all of our bargaining units. Um, so are we going to now look at the median for uh, police 
fire, clerical, DPW, teachers. Um, it's going to be uh, something that is not sustainable at all. Um, this was never discussed as part of the override, um, but it certainly, it certainly should be a part of our discussion. Um, I think that the number is probably right. I just think the time uh, that we're looking at um, doing it over a two-year period is just backbreaking. There is uh, nothing uh, in Massachusetts at the municipal level um, that has come through like this. Um, so we, and I would have said that uh, if I was asked, frankly. Um, it is uh, also a departure from our practice in the select board um, to be outside of the uh, negotiations. For the majority of these uh, contracts, we were not represented by council. <laughs> Um, that is, uh, you know, it's a departure from what we've done. And um, I think that when we first started these contracts, we, it was our understanding that they were at 15%. And then we dug a little bit deeper and that number went to 21%, which was my understanding. And now we're looking at 35%. I am concerned uh, th that um, it is very much not sustainable. Um, it wasn't part of the override. We are ultimately using money that we had sold to the town for the schools, um, and we're using it to pay for this. Um, I don't approve of that. Um, I think uh, there, over the years, have been some problems with the bait and switch of overrides and spending. I think we've overcome that, and I don't think that we need to go back um, to those times. Speaking specifically about the, uh, the police details, um, this was something that actually encouraged me to vote for the DPW contract last year. Um, and uh, it was enormous benefit to the town to be able to say, if, if our uh, workers can't do it, then we can hire outside. Um, so I said, the pay is worth it. Um, later on, I was told that they weren't going to support um, that uh, part of our contract. Um, so we lost that benefit. Um, so I think um, from my perspective, I'm concerned that um, there is a um, real lack of uh, meeting of the minds on these contracts. And uh, I think the number's probably right. We need to sit down back at the table, uh, come back to town meeting in the fall with something that works for a town that is struggling and a town that is uh, going into a pandemic um, and a recession. I just saw on my phone a few seconds ago, the uh, layoffs that are being spread throughout uh, Massachusetts um, for teachers and municipal employees. Um, it's, I, I do this as a volunteer position, and I'm not going to be a part of making decisions um, where um, our community moves towards layoffs. Um, our teachers and our workers are more important than anything we do. Um, and I've said this before, when we had the, uh, just before the, the high school was built and just before Vincent Owen was built, we were uh, identified as a Blue Ribbon School, nationally recognized. Um, it is the excellence of our workers that makes our community excellent. And uh, I think that we need to um, take, take a step back on these contracts and come up with something that works for every single um, one of our bargaining units, um, as well as the town. Uh, I don't know why the town consistently uh, puts itself in bad bargaining positions. We, we just seem to um, lose more than we gain. And um, I hope we can come up with something in the future um, that works for us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Betancourt. Just as a reminder of the town meeting, not our role to delve into the particulars of negotiations or uh, particular numbers, but simply to review and a vote uh, up or down on the contract as a whole as the negotiations have been and belong with the uh, town manager and the other representatives of the town. Uh, further on the question, Mr. Deering. Yes, Mr. Moderator, through you to the police chief, just a quick question on the uh, uh, pay details. They said they were expanding the eligibility. You know, it was always a practice. They couldn't fill it when in town. You know, they go to other towns, Medford, Lexington, what have you. So how are they expanding to uh, help the problems they're having with the uh, pay detail? Chief McDonald, in response to the town meeting member's question. So both unions have agreed to standardize both their policies with regard to details. Um, First, let me say in the past, both unions uh, had some, some very different rules relative to, um, you know, compensation for details. Um, they had similar language with regard to, to who could do details. 
And basically it amounted to full-time Winchester officers, full-time officers from surrounding communities and retired officers very rarely, but uh, were allowed to be sworn in as special officers and, uh, and do details. This contract expands um, that pool of people who can do details <clears throat> um, quite substantially. So um, also in a non-sworn uh, status, which is helpful from an administrative standpoint. So retired Winchester officers would be able to do details as non-sworn. Um, I already have six or seven uh, signed up to do that. Also, retired officers from other communities um, uh, would be allowed to do details in both contracts. Our auxiliary officers who volunteer uh, every year for the town of Winchester, unpaid volunteers who you see uh, at town day, you see them at the NCAR fair directing traffic, helping out uh, for parades. And they do this all this, they do this all, they volunteer their time for the town of Winchester. They would be allowed to, um, to do details. And then finally, the unions have allowed us to have a group of traffic directors, which would be um, just people that we would, um, you know, put a posting out, people could apply for the job, we would train them, and we would have a whole group um, that, that as a last resort we could call, and they would be able to do details. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it, it, it expands the, the pool dramatically, Bob. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, further on the question, uh, Mr. Sabatino. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes, we can, thank uh, you. Th thank you very much. Um, there's no question that um, public safety should be a high priority. The increase is a high priority, but I, I do have huge concern <laughs> on the process of delivering the increases. Um, I got a variety of questions sustainability was there any type of uh analysis performed in the basis uh you know by the select board of the town manager to ensure sustainability because this is a front end loaded contract where it will i feel collide with uh the school's needs eventually so is there a way that we could sort of hear uh how they came up with this uh, to ensure the uh, sustainability? That would be my first question. And Mr. Septino, um, so those are questions that will allow the uh, finance committee to address, sure. not to the um, the particulars of the negotiation, but and we may also seek the town manager's input, but what are your other questions, just so we can uh, collate those and uh, see if we can move towards a vote here? Is there a chance I can make a motion to allocate the funds, but um, also make a motion to uh, not ratify the contract at first uh, 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 article in the fall town meeting? Um, no, that wouldn't okay. be in order. Um, so in response to the uh, town meeting members question about uh, the impact of this contract on the town finances in the budget and the consideration that was undertaken by the finance committee uh, in its recommendation, uh, Ms. Soto. Nicole? Sorry, I was crunching some numbers, looking for my mute button. Uh, so yeah, I think that also dovetails with Carol Savage's earlier question about what our, what our three-year plan last year um, and, and this year had, have shown. So last year, our three-year plan looking out to FY22, which will be the last year of this contract, um, was about, oh, I wrote it down, and, um, was about $600,000 less than what we have now based on the specific details uh, for all of public safety. So all three of these unions combined. Um, we were expecting for um, going into FY 21 and FY22, 5% increases each year in those departments. Um, I think part of that higher number, slightly higher than historical, which we usually see closer to maybe three, um, is because you know town manager was anticipating having to have a market adjustment at some point in the contract. Um, so our, our budget process, you know, once we got the finalized numbers, um, did take this into account. Uh, and like I said earlier, 
we are able to get to FY24 comfortably or up until FY24 comfortably. Um, but it, you know, it, it does put some slight bit more pressure than what we were expecting um, based on our last year's three-year plan. I hope that addresses the question. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Soto. Thank you. Uh, so further on the question and response to that, um, Lisa, did you have something you wanted to add there? Town manager, Lisa Wong? Sure. Um, I, so I will say that um, even though I was given uh, one day to put together a budget last year, um, I was able to put a lot more uh, foresight into this year's budget process uh, because the town was generous in passing an override. Uh, and in, in terms of um, uh, you know the, the process, uh, I actually did not Front load the the contracts um, because by front loading them it would have been significantly higher. So if you reverse um, the colas, you would see that um, it would have a, a market increase on the overall um, projection. So uh, the uh, what was anticipated in terms of the twelve million override that was discussed, and then a reduction to ten million. Um, on a Thursday evening where I had to deliver a budget on the Friday morning, um, I, I knew that immediately, even though there's a $2 million reduction, that my task was still to be as fiscally prudent as possible and to work in collaboration with every single uh, department, including the school department, to um, figure out the task that hadn't been discussed in um, in previous meetings, which was to uh, extend the time period in which we are to ask the voters for another override, as well as to um, go after um, a Lynch and uh, Morocco um, uh, renovation, as well as do a whole bunch of things, which is um, you know to to um, have the best staff possible. Uh, so we've achieved a lot of those things, um, things that we anticipated in the override. Uh, we, you know, we can't anticipate those things um, two years ago. So um, it, some expenses have gone down uh, significantly. Some have gone up more than predicted. So at the end of the day, there is still significant wiggle room, um, like healthcare costs. We've been able to keep those um, significantly lower than projected. And in the past, um, our energy costs are expected to be lower next year than this year. Uh, so, you know, we do the hard work of saving in every line item that we can, and we also have a backlog of things that have been discussed, like a backlog of capital projects, a uh, backlog in public safety of having them even um, step forward in parity, just as we've done with all unions. So when I looked at our ability to achieve the savings that enabled us to potentially push off an override ask to 2024, uh, I knew that I had some wiggle room uh, within all the work that we had done. And I looked at the priorities and for me, public safety and the parity and the money we were wasting and training and losing people, um, the morale issues, the fairness issues, uh, because the employees are our greatest asset. They really are. Um, at least to me as town manager, I cannot do my job without them. Um, I get to see even just a portion of what they do each and every day. And for me, it came to the top. So if I had to invest, I knew that we were increasing capital. I knew that we were doing good in healthcare. I knew that we were doing um, great things in climate change. Um, and you know, there's so many things we're doing great in, including the schools. And if I had to say, what are the material weaknesses as your town manager, what is not only a material weakness in terms of the future finances, because this does have a financial impact, but what has a huge impact in operational issues? Um, imagine if we had um, lost even more you know, firefighters and police during this, this uh, COVID-19. Um, we have that risk assessment plan because we're trying to be proactive. The future is uncertain. It's uncertain financially, but it is also uncertain in terms of shootings. It is also uncertain in terms of, of, of healthcare crises. And I want to have the best workforce possible. And I will say that two years ago, we were struggling and we are still struggling today. We're struggling to hold on to people. Um, the lifelong Winchester firefighters who are committed to here are retiring 
and, and you know, bless them. Um, the, the, the people who are making decisions today are not making the same decisions. This is a critical material weakness operationally, financially, health-wise. We are in danger of not having enough people to respond to heart attacks and strokes. We are in danger of not having enough people um, to fight fires. I mean, so many other fire departments have two sets of gear. We don't have that. It takes something like the coronavirus for us to say, you know what? These guys can't be operating in 24 hours plus with contaminated gear. I mean, in some ways, I, you know, I hate to sound so passionate about this because I, I am the mayor who gave employees eight years of zeros and I was prepared to do that here if it made sense. It did not make sense here. It's been unjust what the, the police and fire have had to do in terms of their parity to the workers and in terms of the increased risk that they've had. Um, and frankly, in the times of coronavirus, in the times of uncertainty, in the times of what's happening with George Floyd, these guys are stepping up. They are stepping up. And I want to make sure that they continue. Um, and, and in fact, it only exacerbates um, you know, us needing to go back and review their contracts and to make sure that we keep and train and have the best people possible so that we have a good future moving forward. Uh, so um, we're now um, moving towards a vote on these before we go broke paying the options technology guys. Uh, but uh, Catherine Tomey, I think, uh, so I'm not going back to people who have spoken previously, but uh, for those who haven't spoken and want to be heard on the issue, uh, under Article 3, the town meeting member, Catherine Tomey, Ms. Tomey. Hello, thank you for recognizing me. I'm not quite sure who this question goes to, but what happens if we don't um, ratify these contracts and appropriate the money to be spent? I'm assuming the contracts have been signed and are in force, but again, what happens if they don't get funded? So the uh, question from the town meeting member is if the town meeting member uh, if the town meeting does not uh, ratify the contracts, uh, what's the consequence uh, there? Um, Ms. Wong, do you want to address that? Uh, if, the, if the contracts are ratified and not funded, uh, I'm going to have to find another way to, uh, to fund the contracts. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know how yet. Um, you guys are throwing a lot at me. <laughs> so uh, I will say no matter what happens, um, you know, I am your professionally paid, you know, town manager who will do the best I can for all of you. Um, so I don't necessarily have an answer, but I will figure it out and I will ask for input. I will ask for help. Um, but I, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll hurt. <laughs> So um, we're now proceeding to a vote under Article 3. The mo there are 16 motions in front of us. We are going to uh, present them uh, one by one. They'll be labeled Article 23, Motion 1, and so forth. The first four motions relate to the town's compensation plan and the transfer of funds as set forth on page 1 three and four, these pages are misnumbered a little bit, I guess um, the first written page is actually two. So two, three, and four, we are gonna consider those motions in order. Motion number one as set forth in the report of the personnel board dated June 8th, 2020. Motion number one, please go to your V voter screens. We're gonna hold the balloting open on these motions for one minute. So now under Article 23, Motion 1, majority vote. All those in favor, please vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. No, that's fine. Are we at? We know.
So the balloting is closing on motion number one, article 23, balloting is closed. Motion number one, 128 in favor, 19 against and four abstain, majority vote required. The motion number one passes. This brings us to motion number two. Under motion number two as set forth on page three of the personnel board report and as written there, motion number two, majority vote, all those in favor, balloting will be open for one minute. All those in favor, please vote yes, all those opposed vote no. Balloting is closed on motion number two. Motion number two, 137 in favor, 18 against, four abstain, majority vote required. The motion passes, brings to motion number three. Motion number three is set forth on page three of the personnel board report. As set forth therein, motion number three, all those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, vote no. Balloting will be open for one minute. Okay, balloting is closed on motion number three. Motion number three, 139 in favor, 15 against, four abstain, majority vote required. The motion passes, brings us to motion number four. Under motion number four is set forth at the bottom of page three and top of page four in the personnel board report, dated June 8th, 2020. The motion is moved and seconded, is set forth therein. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. You guys are getting pretty good at voting. We're gonna try 45 seconds for this vote since that seems to be the time it's taking. Thanks. Balloting is closed, so motion number four, motion number four, 139 in favor, 14 against, three abstain, the motion passes. This brings us to motion number five in the personnel board report dated June 8th, 2020. This is the start of the motions on the police contracts, um, which are motions five through 10. Motion number five, majority vote required. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. Balloting is open for 45 seconds.
Okay, voting is closed under motion number five, 114 in favor, 33 against, and nine abstained. Majority vote required, motion passes. This brings us to the next motion of the police contract. Motion number six, motion number six, which is on page seven, page eight rather, I apologize. Page eight, top of page eight of the personnel board report, June 8, 2020, the motion is as set forth in writing therein. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. Balloting will be open for 45 seconds. Motion number six, balloting is closed, 116 in favor, 32 against, 10 abstentions, majority vote required, the motion passes, brings us to motion number seven is also set forth on page eight of the personnel board report, and as written therein, motion number seven, all those in favor, please vote yes, all those opposed, please vote no, balloting bill for 45 seconds. Holdings closed. So motion number seven. Motion number seven. Majority vote required. 107, 106 in the affirmative. 37 in the negative. 10 abstentions. The motion passes. This brings us to motion number eight under Article 23. Motion number eight is set forth in page eight of the Personnel Board Report dated June 8, 2020. Motion number eight as written in the Personnel Board Report. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor, please vote yes. Opposed, vote no. Balloting will be open for 45 seconds. Balloting is closed, so motion number eight, 111 having voted in the affirmative, 39 in the negative, seven abstain, majority vote required, the motion passes. This brings us to motion number nine. It's on page 11 of the personnel board report dated June 8th, 2020. Page 11, motion number nine, it's moved and seconded as set forth on page 11. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. Majority vote required, 45 seconds for balloting. We need to work on our WinCam studio presentation here. <laughs> Focused on the bald spot on the back of my head. Balloting is closed. So motion number nine, motion number nine, 114 in the affirmative, 36 in the negative, seven abstain. Majority vote required. The motion passes. Brings to motion number 10, also on page 11 of the personnel board report dated June 8, 2020. Under motion number 10, it's moved and seconded. All is set forth in the root materials on page 11. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. 45 seconds for balloting.
Ballot is closed on motion number 10, motion number 10, 170, 100, excuse me, 106 in the affirmative, 40 in the negative, 10 abstentions, uh, the mo majority vote required, the motion passes. This brings us to motion number 11, that's the end of the police contract motions. These motions, uh, motions 11 through 13 are the fire department contracts as previously presented by Mr. Scheimetz on behalf of the personnel board. Motion number 11, which appears at the bottom of page 11 and runs onto page 12 and thereafter. Motion number 11, it's moved and seconded. All is set forth on the personnel board report. 30 seconds for balloting. All those in favor, please vote yes. Opposed, vote no. Majority vote required. Allenings closed to motion number 11, 124 in the affirmative, 30 in the negative, seven abstentions, motion 11 passes. This brings us to motion number 12 on page 15 of the personnel board report. Motion number 12, all as set forth in the report there, it's moved and seconded. All those in favor, please vote yes. Opposed, vote no. Balloting will be open for 30 seconds. Balance closed on motion number 12. Motion number 12, 129 in the affirmative, 30 in the negative, five abstentions, majority vote required. The motion passes. Brings us to motion number 13. On page 15 of the personnel board report, motion number 13 is moved and seconded. All is set forth in the written materials in front of you. On page 15 of the personnel board report, all those in favor, please vote yes. Opposed, please vote no. Balloting going for 30 seconds. Those of you texting my cell phone to complain about my intonation, presentation of the motions, and other personal habits of mine, your your comments have been duly noted. So, <laughs> balloting is closed. The motion number thirteen. Motion number 13, 117 in the affirmative, thirty-five in the negative, six abstentions, the majority vote required. The motion passes. That's the end of the fire. Fighter contract. This brings us to motion number 14, certain changes to the Winchester personnel policy guide. Motion number 14 appears on page 15 of the personnel board report. Motion number 14 moved and seconded. All is set forth on the written materials in front of you. Motion number 14, all in favor, please vote yes. All opposed, please vote no. Balloting vote 30 seconds. Motion number 14, the balloting is closed. Motion number 14, 134 in the affirmative, 24 in the negative, five abstentions, majority vote required, the motion passes. This brings us to motion number 15. Motion number 15 appears on page 16 of the personnel board report dated June 8, 2020. The motion moved and seconded. All is set forth in detail on page 16. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. Balloting will be open for 30 seconds.
Motion number 15, the balloting is closed. Motion number 15, 140 having voted in the affirmative, 15 in the negative, five abstentions, majority vote required, the motion passes. This brings us to the final motion under the personnel board presentation under article 23, motion number 16 appears on page 16. Personnel board report dated June 8, 2020, motion number 16 moved and seconded. All is set forth with particularity in the written materials in front of you. All those in favor, please vote yes. Opposed, please vote no. Majority vote required. Balloting open for 30 seconds. Allen is closed on motion number 16 and our motion number 16 majority vote required 134 in the affirmative 20 in the negative eight abstentions the motion passes. This concludes our consideration of article 23 Mr. Shymetz, thank you very much Chief McDonald as well Ms. Wong the select board and Ms. Soto on behalf of the finance committee we appreciate your assistance to the debate this evening. This returns us to article 6. I've asked Ms. Lannon if I might go look for Girl Scout cookies. She's told me no. So uh, we, uh, we are here um, pushing through. Um, article six uh, is a article uh, under which proposed by the select board and under article six, it's moved in second to the town in accordance with chapter seven, section three of the town of Winchester Code of Bylaws, but to amend the water and sewer rates currently in effect. All bills for consumption on or after March 1st, 2020 shall be in conformance with the following rates. The terms of the motion and the rates are all as set forth on page nine of the 2020 spring annual town meeting book. And uh, on behalf of the proponents of article six, the select board, Ms. Verdicchio, Ms. Verdicchio. Oh, I apologize, this is a video presentation. Mr. Griffin will load that for us. Excuse me, Susan. Good evening, town meeting members. Ms. Shapiro and I will be here providing some background on the board's proposal for water and sewer rates and why the board asked for your support of this article. The Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund was established in 2003 and has always supported operations, maintenance, and capital improvement of the town's water, sewer, and stormwater drainage systems by the Water and Sewer Division of the DPW. As an enterprise fund, it operates on a fee-for-service basis, billing users based on their consumption, with any revenues in excess of expenses at the year end kept in the fund as retained earnings. With recent total annual budgets over $10 million, it represents about 7% of the town's total operational costs. Winchester has over 100 miles of water mains and pipes, 85 miles of sewer mains, and about the same amount of separate storm drainage pipes with manholes and the related components. The town also operates its own water treatment plant built in the Fells in 1996 at a cost of about $6.8 million that supplies, most, supplies almost half of our annual water needs. The rest of our water and all of the town's sewage service is through the MWRA, for which the town pays assessments of over $6 million annually. The Water and Sewer Division has 19 full-time staff, and the Enterprise Fund also pays debt service for water, sewer, and storm drainage projects. Some examples are the drainage project at Wildwood Road and the upcoming water project to rehabilitate the North Reservoir Dam. It also supports regular maintenance of storm drains and over 3,000 catch basins, water testing, and other requirements of the increasingly stringent federal EPA stormwater permit. This is a summary of the fund's major expense categories for fiscal 21, where you can see the MWRA assessment is the largest expenditure. Stormwater permit costs are broken out at $205,000 and the fiscal 21 total enterprise budget of 11.6 million. This chart shows the history of our annual MWRA assessments from 2008 to 2021. Assessments for both sewer, the top line, and water, the lower line, are moving upwards. They've grown substantially over this period. In the last five years, the combined assessments show an average 4.4% annual increase. 
So how are these operations and the MWRA assessments financed? The fund's primary source of revenue is from user bills. Quarterly bills charge for water and sewer at different rate tiers based on usage with a surface charge of $5 per bill for administrative costs. Debt service for capital projects is a bit complex. The town shifts a portion to the annual tax bills according to a state law, Chapter 110, which is aligned with federal tax law. And then it's transferred to the enterprise fund to cover debt service. The fund's accumulated retained earnings for many years, used only for capital costs, has recently also become the source of support for growing permit compliance needs and other operational uses too. After a proposal for a stormwater fee was unsuccessful last November, the board and town management worked with the town's longstanding financial consultant, the Abrahams Group, to better understand the fund's overall financial position. As we said, the fund's primary source of support comes from user bills, and that revenue is variable and subject to weather patterns. This graph plots the rainfall during the months April through September in the blue bars and compares it to town water usage build out, and that's the orange line. For example, in dry weathers, in dry weather years, for example, 2015 and 16, revenues rose, retained earnings reached $1.7 million in 2017. When rainfall is high, as it has been in the last few years, the blue bars to the right, billings tend to be lower. We're in a period of high rainfall, lower billings right now, and drawing upon those retained earnings. About the service charge, town meeting first approved a service charge in 2007 as a mechanism to recover costs that do not vary with water sewer usage. That amount has never been updated. These fixed costs include administrative staffing of three full-time employees, and portions of staff time at DPW, engineering, collector treasurer's office, and the controller. Reading 7,200 meters townwide via radio, processing about 28,000 bills, meter service and replacement. Our consultant's analysis, based on next year's budget, determined these costs currently exceed about $880,000. Town staff also contacted nearby communities to gather some comparative data, which was also reviewed by the consultant, and that's shown in this chart. This confirms the existing $20 per year service charge amount is well below other communities. As you will see in the background of the article, the water and sewer billings are not keeping up with our expenses and needs to keep the water and sewer systems running properly. The town did not raise water and sewer rates in fiscal year 2019 and only 3.5% for fiscal year 20. Despite the 3.5% rate increase, water and sewer billings in fiscal year 2020 were down about 8% from fiscal year 2019's billings. Winchester is not alone. Many non-urban communities in the Commonwealth have seen similar decreases in consumption and billing in fiscal year 20 and are considering larger than normal rate increases to generate revenue and to replenish dwindling retained earnings. This spring was a relatively wet one and fiscal year 20 consumption was the lowest it's been in five years. If you look at the average rainfall from April through September from 2017 to 2019, it was 26.2 inches. From 24 to 26, 2014 to 2016, the average was 17.93 inches. When the spring is wet, outdoor water use and bills are significantly lower resulting in a deficit like we see for fiscal year 21. Additionally, the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund has had to rely on retained earnings and this is no longer sustainable. After fiscal year 20 expenditures, the projected FY20 deficit of over 400,000 and fiscal year 21 appropriations being voted on at this town meeting, the retained earnings will be depleted and without significant action in the form of rate increases and an increase in the service charge, it will be very hard to rebuild. The fiscal year 21 budget shortfall is 1.3 million and retained earnings cannot support this deficit. The recommended approach by the select board and town departments is to increase the water and sewer rates by 12% and increase the fixed service charge from $5 per bill to $30 per bill. As mentioned earlier, the predicament that we find ourselves in has been primarily caused by the fluctuation 
in water and sewer bills given the rainy springs that we've had over the past few years. This has led to the depletion of the water and sewer retained earnings and is not sustainable. With large scale projects, operating costs, and MS4 stormwater permit requirements, it is critical that the Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund have a stable and predictable stream of revenue, which the increase in the service charge would accomplish. In addition, projections show a small surplus of FY 2021 with the recommended approach, which would be added to retained earnings at the end of the fiscal year. The alternative would be to fully deplete retained earnings and utilize a general fund free cash subsidy of over $1.3 million. So what does this mean for property owners? In the chart, you will see the quarterly water and sewer bills for average users. The bill amounts show the combined impact of the rate adjustment and service charge increase. The last column on the right shows the difference between existing bills and proposed level of increased bills. For the average residential user, the impact would be about $36 per bill or $144 per year. While we understand that this is a change and will impact many of our residents, the alternative is much more daunting. The alternative approach would be to use the remainder of retained earnings and use a free cash subsidy of over $1.3 million. This is a temporary fix at best. Without retained earnings, we would be in trouble should a large scale emergency product project come up. And decreasing the town's free cash position is an approach that is not recommended. Water and sewer retained earnings were certified at 1,081,534 as of July 1st, 2019. A portion of available retained earnings has been used during the current fiscal year for capital outlays and stormwater permit compliance, but also to support the operational budget. In total, over 700,000 of retained earnings have already been appropriated to fund FY 2020 expenditures and the projected FY 2020 deficit. Only about 333,000 of available retained earnings, or roughly 3% of annual operating costs, will remain. Additional appropriations being considered at this town meeting would bring the retained earnings down to 1.2% of budget. As a best practice, a retained earnings balance of at least 10% of annual operating costs is recommended. A healthy retained earnings balance allows an enterprise fund to manage an operating deficit due to a wet year, and to handle unexpected large expenses and emergency projects. So our town is facing a very difficult situation. In order for our dedicated DPW water and sewer department to conduct business and take proper care of our systems, we need to find a way to no longer work at a deficit. The service charge, which is mentioned, would still be below neighboring communities and has not been adjusted in 13 years and would allow the department to have a predictable, stable source of revenue. And the rate increase, which is lower than it would have been without the service charge increase, will help to offset the deficits that we are currently experiencing. While this is a more expensive option for, for property owners, the select board feels strongly that it will put our town in a better financial position going forward. We will be able to cover the water and sewer budget while also starting to rebuild the retained earnings that have been spent down over the past few years. The alternative would require a 1.3 million general fund subsidy, and while residents will not see an increase in their rates, the town will be in a precarious position with no retained earnings to rely on should a large or emergency project come up. So we hope that we can count on your support on this article. It was a massive effort driven by our amazing town staff to determine the best recommendation to mitigate the water and sewer deficits that we are faced with. On behalf of the entire select board, I'd like to give a shout out to Lisa Wong, Mark Tugood, Stacy Ward, Jay Gill, Leanne McGann, Beth Rudolph, Meg White, James Gibbons, and our consultant, Matt Abrahams from the Abrahams Group. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing your vote. Thank you very much. Um, so on article six, may we have a recommendation from the finance committee, Ms. Soto. 
Yes, Finance Committee voted favorable action on this um, on this article. We realize that retained earnings will not be able to, to plug this gap. Um, without this article passing, as was stated in the presentation, um, we're gonna need to use about $1.3 million of free cash. And further, we don't know how much free cash will be need to use the next year if another water and sewer rate doesn't increase, because this isn't just a one-time thing and it will be a, a, something we'll have to revisit year after year if we don't see this, um, this rate increase. And certainly using free cash um, year over year wouldn't be sustainable either. So, um, and as was discussed a little bit in the presentation, um, it is a big chunk of our free cash. Using this would bring us down to about 9% um, before of, of overall, um, when we'd look at our overall, our reserves percentage um, before any turn back. So it, it's, it is a big chunk and we do recommend favorable action on this one. Thank you very much, Ms. Soto. Uh, further on the question, Roger Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, question to the proponents and a question to the Finance Committee. To the proponents, um, uh, is there any uh, effort to uh, identify a, a, a growth rate to manage to in this enterprise? Uh, we don't have much direct influence on it. And I'm wondering if there is an effort to uh, improve productivity and grow at a lower rate than maybe the rest of the town. And to the finance committee, I just want to know, it was mentioned that the compliance expenditures are operational. And I wondered uh, why they're in the capital uh, budget. Ms. Ferdicchio, in response to the Tommy member's, member's question about the about management, management of, of uh, uh, these funds, funds and enterprises to a particular growth rate. Well, um, as we noted, this is not a permanent fix. This is not um, a, a, an overhaul or a long range plan. And we really anticipate that we would need to come back and revisit this more often than we have in the past. I think one, of the factors that have gotten us into this situation is that we, the select board did not um, look at this in detail um, every year. We just, we had, but we had, uh, and what allowed us to do that was the um, ample amount of retained earnings that's not there anymore. So we have to be more cognizant that we have to um, really look at this as um, something that we have to have a long range uh, plan for. We, um, also realize that we need to um, probably revisit and have a, a better sustainable plan for managing our stormwater, uh, the, the stormwater part of this um, uh, this fund. And and yes, we're tr we would be trying to look to manage um, the the finances better and a goal, you know, and understand how all of these different parts. Um, um, and then the, the, the second question, I think um, maybe our consultant could, could address a little better than I could. I think um, if, if the, the gentleman is still here, uh, if Matt Abraham, Abrahams is uh, with the DPW and might be able to address the second question. Mr. Abrahams from the Abrahams group. We're going to elevate him if we can find him. Uh, Ms. Soto, maybe in the interim, you could respond to the question about the capital allocation that Mr. Wilson asked. Right. So the capital allocation is there because the capital improvement expenses need to stay in the enterprise fund account um, dedicated to water and sewer. That's the reason we have the enterprise fund account um, to make sure that, that those stay with the water and sewer enterprise fund budget since those capital improvements are specifically for those operations um and probably dpw folks can give more color to right. the specifics of that as well yeah. so uh thank you very much if we could mute something here um further on the question uh mr conti mr conti Quick question to the uh, selectmen: Will we uh, can we expect a, a recommendation for a reduction uh, in the rate in the water rate in the event uh, that there's a drought? He asked somewhat facetiously. Well, um, I could say that uh, in the past, based on past experience, when there is uh, when when a drought 
you know, we have a, a number of years with drought conditions, our, uh, our usage goes up and we have, um, you know, we are bringing in more. And so, uh, you, we, yes, we would consider a, 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 a reduction. I think we need to, as I said before, I think we need to look at this every year and, and manage it better. But again, I can't control the weather. Are there any questions, questions, Mr. Calvin? Yes, thank you, Ms. Rotary. I just two questions. One, um, does this increase in the, uh, the user fee, does that negate the need for a separate stormwater uh, utility and separate charge? And the second is how long do you think the 12% increase in water rates will last us? Possibly how many members question is ready here. Well, um, I, I, you know, we, we do need to go back and develop a better approach to managing and financing the stormwater part of these operations. And I, I think a stormwater fee might be in our future. I think we would um, definitely go back and take a look at that, but we need to do a better job of designing it and, and have some better outreach and education to the community if we're gonna do that. Um, I forget what the second question was, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, about how long do you think the 12% oh. increase in rates will last us? Um, we don't really know. We have different um, uh, projections. That's something that the Abrahams um, group is, is very good at doing. There are multiple ways of doing this. In order to rebuild the um, retained earnings, we would need to keep rates ticking up at a lower increase than the 12%, more like 5 to 7%. Um, but, but the service charge would stay the same. Thank you. Further on the question, uh, Mr. Jarius. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'm a little perplexed by the size of the, um, the, the fee increase. In particular, in my situation, in my household, we will now be paying more in fee than we are going to be paying for water and sewage because we adhere to the adage, uh, don't use profligately. So I'm trying to understand why it is that this fee was not shifted more towards higher use or more on the usage side. Um, because again, I find it odd that I'm gonna be paying more in fee than I will for water and sewage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charius and Ms. Verdicchio. Yes, um, uh, a number of people have asked that and um, we could go back and, and develop a tiered service charge, but uh, that's not something we looked at for this time because um, we, we really couldn't find any uh, research or, or basis for the $5 per bill, the $20 per year. And so we looked very um, closely at what the actual costs were. And um, in it, uh, as we mentioned, it's staffing and the, the full-time staff, the salary and benefits, it's um, parts of the, the staff time for the control treasurer, collector treasurer, the controller, um, the um, uh, audit, uh, does, and uh, the Abrahams group did a very uh, complete analysis of that and found that, um, you know, in fact, we were spending upwards of $800,000 every year. So um, that's how it worked out. Um, I would say that this, like anything else, we should keep an eye on uh, for going forward and make it more um, uh, tailored to the actual costs. And also that, you know, as we we started actually even today looking at developing a tiered approach to so that the higher users would pay a higher or a higher service charge for these administrative costs so that that we could do um may i may I have a follow-up certainly mr Harris. um so i'm not disputing the costs what i am disputing is the decision making making process you certainly have the data to show how much individual households are being are paying and so you could certainly determine how many households are paying below, would be paying below the fee. And so it seems a little strange that you are now considering doing an analysis on whether a tiered fee would be appropriate. I am concerned that 
it was just decided we need a higher fee. And uh, the more difficult decision as to how can we more equitably share that fee across users was not considered. Thank you. So further in response to the Tommy member's question, uh, Ms. Shapiro, did you want to respond as well? Yeah, not sure. Um, I just wanted to respond to that and to add um, said that a lot of the towns that in terms of charge uh, were based on the size of the meters um, and size of the meters in Winchester, um, about 92% of all meters are five eighths or an inch. Um, so I, I can't get into the engineering and all of that in terms of what that means, but from a size perspective, um, that's typically how your direct work has been charged. So it really wouldn't, um, in a place like this, make a lot of difference. So I just wanted to back on that that point, um, Mr. Darius, about through the moderator um, that we did we did explore that in looking at comparison towns to buy as you'll see um, in the uh, motion book um, background. But there's there's uh, the the way that we looked at it. It wasn't an arbitrary decision to change the fee. It was that we looked at needed to both cover our operating costs as well as um, building up our return earnings. So it was it certainly wasn't an arbitrary. Thank you, Ms. Shapiro. Uh, further on the question, Mr. McCarthy, Brian McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I had one question. Um, I, I agree that the, the fee um, is too much in one fell swoop. Um, that I, I was looking at those lowest users, their, their fees are going up 67% and the highest users are going up maybe 15, 17%. So there's definitely some equity issues there. Uh, my question is, is in multi-unit um, uh, buildings, when the water comes in, how is the water split? Is it one um, line coming in or is that every single water user has a meter? So in response to Tommy Member's question about the way in which uh, water is apportioned in large buildings where there are multiple units in a dwelling, um, in the way in which the fee is apportioned, is it by the dwelling or is it per unit? Well, th this is something, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just, I was just gonna say from what I understand. Hey, Amy, I, we having a little trouble hearing you. So if you could hold your microphone closer or boost your ball, sure. volume a little bit, we're getting some questions on that. Sure, is that better? A little bit, yep. Okay. Um, from what I understand from our DPW um, staff, uh, most, Units, even uh, units within a condominium complex, are individual metered units. I think that there's one, um, the large um, apartment building on Swanton Street is the one that has um, one uh, multiple uh, large units for those apartments. But I think that, as far as I understand, um, other condo uh, associations have one per unit. Thank you very much. I don't see any further hands raised with respect to the debate or the discussion. And accordingly, we are ready to proceed for a vote uh, on Article 6. This is the article. The motion is as set forth on page 9 of your uh, warrant booklet. Um, the motion has been made and seconded, and as previously set forth in writing on page nine of the warrant booklet, majority vote required. Balloting will be open for 45 seconds, and Article 6, we are just, where is that? Oh. Um, Okay, so we have one uh, question, and if you could just raise your hand, but Ms. Savage has uh, used the chat function for that to say speak, which I think we allow for. So uh, Ms. Savage, further on uh, the motion under Article 6. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. My, my screen shows my hand was raised, but um, uh, I just have one uh, last question. I support this motion. Um, uh, water and sewage are important. I think the rate is, it sounds like it's needed and justified. I did want to support um, what sounds like the need for a long range plan 
that I would urge be maybe shared with town meeting members in the fall. Um, and I have just one question. Um, it seems that the biggest challenge has to do with seasonality for uh, the what must be lawn watering part of the water usage revenue. And it would seem like that might be uh, something one could project the what is the sort of seasonality highs and lows such that uh, when you are in a year that is a uh, wet year and water revenue then falls um, and then you move to a year that's high and so water usage drops that you have an operating principle to retain earnings in those uh, years that are wet years so that you do have this uh, retained earnings um, when you need them in the dry years. Is that okay. part of your plan going forward to the select board? Ms. Savage to the select board about the uh, long range plan. Ms. Verdicchio in response to the question. That, yes, that's what we're, we're beginning to un understand that we need to do is to project things. And um, I mean, that's what's happened in the past. So yes, we would try to do that build up retained earnings that way. So just as a follow-up, if that's what an operating principle so that we could be planning and hearing that like in a in a in a dry year, I'm getting confused, which is which mm. that we in fact retained your earnings. And there might be some principle we would articulate around that. Like a policy on on putting them into yeah. retained earnings. Yeah. When you put report out the long range plan, maybe you could address that. Will do. Further in the question, uh, Mr. Miller, John Miller. I, I believe that's what DPW is doing and that's we're replenishing the uh, retained earnings. So that's that's part of the plan already, I believe. Yes, that's correct. Th thank you, Mr. Miller. Further in the question, I believe um, Ms. Von Mehring had a question, Ms. Von Mehring. Um, Yeah, so a couple things. One, we have a deficit and we need to pick it up and so I am in favor of going forward with this. However, with that, I don't think that the fee structure is equitable and we don't have the ability right now to go through and address that at this time. I just was hoping to get a very clear commitment from the select board that they will go forward and continue to look at this and um, deal with um, looking at the stormwater versus water and sewer and the fee structure to make it more equitable. Um, so we'll deal with it now, but come back. And um, so if we can get, if the proponents are willing to make that commitment, I'm willing to vote in favor of this. Ms. Von Mehring asking the select board as proponents to commit to continue to study these rates and their equitable effect across the user base. Ms. Bardicchio in response to that request. Yes, I think that's, uh, I don't think, yes, that's in our, that is in our future. We would be very willing to do that. Amy and I have invested a lot of time in, in learning about this, uh, this whole realm. So yes, we would be in, in favor of doing that. Yeah. Few politicians able to resist the question, will you agree to treat people equitably? Although they're out there. <laughs> so here we are in Article 6, majority vote required. Balloting is open. Um, 45 seconds to vote on Article 6, majority vote required. We're going to tee that up now. Article six on your V voter screens, all those in favor, please vote yes, opposed, please vote no. Majority vote required, 45 seconds. Voting is closed in Article 6, a majority vote required 116 in the affirmative, 34 in the negative, three abstentions, the motion passes. Article 6 is passed, Article 7 and 8 were passed as part of the consent agenda. This brings us to Article 9, under Article 9, the 
motion is as set forth in the motion booklet. It's on page 15. This is a motion to appropriate $1,500,000 for a feasibility study of the Lynch Elementary School. It's brought by the school committee, requires a two thirds vote. On behalf of the proponents under Article 9, do we have a presentation? We have a, a recorded presentation and we will play that now. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, town meeting members, town staff, and any Lynch families who may be joining us this evening. I'm pleased to present for consideration a request to fund the early feasibility study, estimated at no more than $1.5 million, for the replacement of the Lynch Elementary School in partnership with the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or MSBA. Much like the background in your town meeting packets, my presentation tonight will make some brief mentions of the Morocco Elementary School. This is intentional to provide context for our consideration of Article 10, which follows. Most of you will recognize the key five-year goals set forth in the School Facilities Master Plan. Phase one of McCall's expansion opened in 2018, and the much more ambitious phase two is on budget and on schedule to welcome students in the fall. The two largest and most ambitious projects, however, are the replacement of the Lynch and Morocco elementary schools. Both are near or above capacity, have inflexible designs for today's elementary education, and in many instances, building systems have outlived their useful lives. As we all know, building systems and components do not last indefinitely. The town's VFA facilities database suggests that by the year 2030, we face over $32 million in renewal and replacement costs at Lynch and nearly 20 million at Morocco. Of course, we don't have these kinds of resources at our disposal in the stabilization funds, but even if we did, the school committee prefers the wholesale replacement of both elementary schools, given the compounding restrictions of their designs, age, and space constraints. Therefore, in the spring of 2017, with the 10-year facilities master plan in final draft form, the school committee, with the support of the select board, made a strategic decision to seek partnership with the state school building authority for the replacement of both the Morocco and Lynch elementary schools. Application to the MSBA is a time intensive and competitive process with between 60 to 90 projects submitted by districts each year and sometimes fewer than 10 making the cut for invitation into the pre-schematic eligibility phase of the core replacement program. The MSBA partners with communities to support the design and construction of educationally appropriate, flexible, sustainable, and cost-effective educational facilities. Their dedicated revenue stream comes from the state sales tax, in which one penny of every sales tax dollar goes to support the agency and its grant programs. You can quickly tell then that the appeal of partnership with the MSBA is fundamentally a financial one, as districts receive substantial reimbursements for every project cost invoice, including those associated with the feasibility phase, which we are considering this evening. Our recent experience with the MSBA on two major projects underscores this point. Partnership on the replacement of the Vincent Owen School from 2010 to 2013 saw a 40% reimbursement rate on a nearly $30 million project. And the following reconstruction and expansion of Winchester High School yielded nearly 42% in reimbursements to the town or a grant of over $44 million. In both instances, the participation with the MSBA directly lowered our net project costs, which meant less borrowing impacting our tax bills. The town's Educational Facilities Planning and Building Committee, or EFPBC for short, oversaw both of these projects on behalf of Winchester. The EFPBC's diverse representation of architects, engineers, contractors, and other building professionals brings helpful oversight to our large school building projects and they will be similarly engaged in the Lynch replacement project. When the MSBA partners with a district, it's because the board finds the project eligible and a priority over other submittals based on an evaluation of specific criteria published in the SOI process. 
In this instance, the school committee and select board identified three eligible criteria for consideration of the Morocco and Lynch elementary schools. Existing enrollment and overcrowding, future space constraints and impact associated with additional enrollment growth, and finally, the existing physical plan's age, configuration, and condition. As I mentioned at the outset tonight, the school committee opted in 2017 to submit statements of interest to the MSBA for both the Morocco and Lynch elementary schools. Our applications were denied. We tried again in 2018, at which time the authority sent their senior study team to Lynch and the executive director paid a personal visit to Morocco. Still though, no invitation came. After our third attempt last spring, the district was notified in December of the Lynch School's invitation to the eligibility period of the MSBA's core replacement program. This 270-day pre-schematic phase began officially only in April. It involves a more thorough documentation of project need, existing physical plant, enrollment information, and educational programming. While there are no direct costs to us associated with eligibility, other than our time, the period closes with a vote by the MSBA board to enter into the feasibility study phase with Winchester. A prerequisite for the board vote is our commitment to funding the feasibility study, which will develop the space program and schematic design for a new Lynch, along with much needed cost estimates. It is this commitment to funding that is the subject of Article 9 before you this evening. We are very fortunate for the Lynch project to have been selected. In the most recent 2019 MSBA cycle, 61 statements of interest from 51 districts were submitted for consideration in the core replacement program. Only 11 projects made the shortlist, five of them elementary schools. Taking a look again at the three criteria, due to sharp growth by the fall of 2015, just two years after redistricting with the expanded Vincent Owen, Lynch was 9% over its design capacity of 420 K through five students with an enrollment of 459. This figure excludes the nearly 90 youngsters attending the district's preschool program at Lynch. Since that time, enrollment has grown each year with several specialty or support spaces taken for additional classrooms along the way. For the 16-17 school year, the superintendent moved two of Lynch's preschool classrooms to the new Vincent Owen, though this building was not designed to accommodate a preschool. A new Lynch, which takes a key step forward with your support this evening, will include an expanded and consolidated preschool program once again, this time purposely designed for our youngest learners. This fall, Lynch welcomed 471 elementary students, and since then, 11 more for a total of 482 as of last week. 5% growth in four and a half years. As difficult as our present day enrollment and space constraints are, our future has us even more concerned. Based on the town's census data and kindergarten screenings, administration is expecting 505 students at Lynch in the fall, a 10% increase over FY16. This requires 26 sections in grades K through five in a building with only 21 spaces intended for such a purpose. Winchester's planning department has seen no let up in our rate of demolition permits for larger homes since the 2017 master plan. Multi-unit projects in the central business district we highlighted in 2017 are now complete and on the market while others are in development pipeline and moving forward. There continues to be progress towards 40B affordable housing development as well. Although an appeal was recently filed with Superior Court, the 96 unit project off Cambridge Street was recently approved by Land Court. The Lynch District 40B project on River Street has been granted approval by the ZBA and is estimated to bring between 86 to 90 students into our district, at least 30 of them elementary students. Taking stock of all the development the planning department is tracking, we estimate over 340 new units of housing to come online, much of it in the next 18 to 24 months. This large number does not include the Waterfield project or the development of the Thai Logistics Holton Street property, which was recently acquired by Bain Capital. With respect to the third and final criteria, let's come back to the Lynch School's configuration, age, and condition. 
At approximately 84,000 square feet, Lynch was designed as Winchester's junior high school and built from 1960 to 61. It's a sprawling, mostly one-story building with both flat and sloped roof areas framed with light steel columns and beams. There hasn't been a major building renovation or addition to the school since, beyond minor space alterations to accommodate the district's preschool program and a limited bathroom renovation in 2012. The school's 21 general education classroom spaces vary in size to as little as 800 square feet, well below today's design standards and MSBA guidelines. Beyond the preschool program being split between Lynch and Vince and Owen, all available instructional spaces have been repurposed into classrooms. This has led to a space shortage for special education, small group and individualized meeting spaces, reduced space for library, media, and technology, teacher workspaces in the hallways, and no available space to add additional classrooms. One of the school's two boilers is original, while the others is 16 years old. Lynch's fire alarm system was updated in 2009, and the last improvement to the building envelope, a new roof, came shortly thereafter. The exterior windows are steel framed, single pane, and original to the building, as are most doors and are in poor condition. The HVAC and electrical systems also date to 1960. Let's take a quick look around the exterior. One of Lynch's most striking design strengths is the amount of natural light brought into the school thanks to the floor to ceiling windows along the corridors at the school's courtyards and entry and exit points. Unfortunately, with 1960s design and technology, this comes at a tremendous cost today. We calculate that Lynch's exterior wall assemblies have an R value no greater than nine, while today's standards set the minimum at 25. Portions of the north and west ends of Lynch were designed partially sunken, some three feet below adjacent grade, as the image on the left represents. This has led to water infiltration, flooring failures, and expensive repairs over the years. To the right, we see what happens when carbon steel is exposed to the elements for generations. To be clear, Lynch has been maintained and repainted over the years, but this eventually becomes a larger and more expensive battle with time. At the rear of Lynch, we see representative rot and deterioration in the exterior openings. Note the original window sills are a porous stone. These absorb water, which then drives spalling and cracking in our winter freeze-thaw cycles. Broken stone sills then permit further deterioration of the envelope. On my recent visit last month, I found the pedestal to Lynch's birdbath with a rather sad note attached. If anyone knows the whereabouts of the bowl, our Lynch teachers would really appreciate its return. Your support tonight is an essential early step as we move towards a vote on the feasibility study for a Lynch replacement school that began with our notice of invitation in December. The administration and school committee will continue our data collection and provide project vetting with the state through September. And the MSBA Executive Board has scheduled a vote by the end of the year on moving into feasibility with the project. I'd like to underscore tonight that securing local vote authorization, the subject of Article 9, is a prerequisite to the board vote in December. If we fail to earn your support to fund the feasibility study before then, Winchester will be kicked out of the core replacement program and will have to start from scratch again, further delaying a new Lynch for two or three years. After RFPs, contracting, and team building with the EFPBC in the spring, we estimate design work could begin by the summer. With options for review with Winchester in the fall of 2021, and a final preferred design option for the new Lynch submitted to the MSBA for approval in the winter of 2022. After a period of further design development and reconcile cost estimates, we anticipate coming back to 2022 fall town meeting to consider the project funding agreement and subsequently a townwide ballot question to fund construction, just as we did for Vincent Owen and the Winchester High School. At this time, we envision a new Lynch open for students no sooner than the fall of 2025. If this seems like a long way away, it is. But a side-by-side -side comparison with key milestones in the Vincent Owen project illustrate a timeline only five months longer overall. In this instance, for a Lynch larger than the new Vincent Owen and construction on an occupied site. 
town meeting members, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have been able to present Article 9 to you this evening. Tonight is a moment that the school committee, administration, select board, and many town officials have been looking forward to since we voted the school facilities master plan nearly three years ago. Our past projects with the MSBA have been successful, innovative, and cost-effective, yielding outstanding school facilities so supportive of teaching and learning. Tonight, I ask your support towards a new and exciting Lynch Elementary School, one that will continue to nurture our students' lifelong love for learning for decades more to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Uh, for those of you asking the procedural question, when will this be over? Um, we are going to vote on Article 9. There's a short Article 10 that's somewhat interrelated, requesting the appropriation of 30,000 from Morocco. So we'll do 9 and 10, and then we will uh, adjourn until uh, Thursday evening at 7.30. Um, so the uh, Article 9 requiring a two-thirds vote brought by the school committee. The select board recommends favorable action. May we have a recommendation from the finance committee, Ms. Soto? Uh, finance committee also recommends favorable action. We definitely have been hearing about Lynch for quite a while, and we were anticipating this in our support. Thank you, Ms. Soto. Further on the question? Not seeing any members with their hands raised. Further than the question, Ms. DeLeo from Precinct 5. Ms. DeLeo. Um, yes, thank you, moderator. I am wondering if the videos are posted anywhere on the town website. Yes, um, they should be. And after tonight, all of these videos will be up on the town's uh, webpage. Mr. Nixon, I think, has his airing on Hulu as well, if you have another hour left. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, further on the question, question comes before the town meeting on article nine. The motion is on page 15 of the motion book it requires a two thirds vote because of the borrowing under the appropriation. The motion is moved and second, the town appropriate $1,500,000 all, all is more particularly set forth on page 15 of the motion booklet. Please go to your V voter screen for balloting. All those in favor, please vote yes. All those opposed, please vote no. The ballot will be open for 45 seconds. On Article 9, two thirds vote required. Ballot is closed on Article 9. Under Article 9, 131, having voted in the affirmative, seven in the negative, one abstention, two-thirds threshold having been met, Article 9 passes. This brings us to the last article of the evening, Article 10. Article 10, brought by Mr. Bettencourt as the chair of the select board. It's moved and seconded that $30,000 be appropriated from free cash for architectural and engineering consulting services for the Morocco Elementary School. All is more particularly set forth on page 18 of the motion booklet. Article 10 by its proponent, Mr. Betancourt. Mr. Betancourt. Oh, there's a, I'm sorry, there's a four minute, I'm told, four minute video presentation. Thank you, Mr. Betancourt, for that. Good evening, town meeting members. My name is Mike Betancourt, chair of the Winchester Select Board. Hi again, I'm Chris Nixon from the school committee, sticking around for the presentation of Article 10, which is a request for $30,000 to fund architectural and engineering consulting services to assist in the development of a new interim capital plan for the Morocco Elementary School. 
As Chris just shared under Article 9, the school committee and select board remain committed to the replacement of the Morocco Elementary School in partnership with the MSBA. However, with the news in December that Lynch was invited into the eligibility period, the school committee has seen the need to pivot towards an interim capital plan for Morocco. As excited as we were to have Vincent Owen selected by the state for partnership in 2010, we were especially surprised and grateful for the state's invitation to partner on the Winchester High School project only three years later. But it's important for town meeting to understand that this was a most unusual circumstance. Having two major capital projects at the same time with the state school building authority with some degree of overlap rarely happens. While we remain committed to the replacement of Morocco and getting that process underway before the current master plan expires, using our own history as a guide, we do not expect being in serious contention for an eligibility period invitation for at least another two to three years. Winchester must take, must take its turn going to the back of the line with other districts, so to speak. With a new Lynch estimated no earlier than the fall of 2025, we see a Morocco replacement no sooner than the fall of 2028. If the long-term plan is a replacement some eight years away, we must now look more carefully at a focused interim capital plan for the physical plant today. One that recommends high value, smart investments to sustain the school's spaces and systems to a reasonably planned point of replacement. As Mr. Nixon noted under Article 9, the town's VFA facilities database projects nearly $20 million in renewal and replacement costs at Morocco in the next 10 years. And since our VFA tool is not designed with an end-of-use concept for facilities, the school committee wishes to take a look at this helpful information from a slightly different point of view. Systems and building components recommended for replacement because of their age must be reevaluated to consider their actual present day condition and remaining useful life. This is no episode of Antiques Roadshow, but the basement of the Morocco Elementary School, where we see the original mothballed sectional boilers in the rear and the high efficiency modular gas fired units installed a decade ago on the right. This was a targeted system upgrade at the time, but what other building systems need renewal or replacement to reliably serve Morocco for another eight years or even a decade more? Morocco is six years younger than Lynch, so its exterior is in noticeably better overall condition. Although many of the classroom windows are steel framed, single pane like Lynch, the building's entry points are aluminum rather than steel, so have fared much better over the years. Yet even so, the door hardware is tired and failing, and we have some masonry failures to address as well. Along with new flat work or paving as seen on the right, and our 2016 repainting of the fascias and soffits has begun to fail. Beyond some of these more obvious areas of concern, the question is, what else needs to be done that may not jump out at us? What fans are near failure? What pipes and fittings need urgent replacement? And so on. The goal is to invest what is needed now to ensure Morocco can provide a quality learning environment through the remainder of its anticipated life, avoiding major costly repairs shortly before its replacement. Our proposed plan will identify priorities and recommended sequencing of necessary work over the next couple of years, including ranges of costs based on site observations and consultant experience in today's bidding climate. No architectural or engineering drawings are required as this is not a design exercise, but rather a written report to help prepare the school committee for capital project submissions through the usual process beginning later this summer, and perhaps a follow-up to fall town meeting should a larger project be necessary in FY22 or shortly thereafter. At this time, we aren't sure what Morocco needs, but we're sure that we need to figure it out and make a plan. Chris and I thank you for your attention tonight and we ask for your support in this small but important step towards an interim capital plan for the Morocco School. I can share with you this evening that the select board has voted to recommend favorable action on Article 9 unanimously. And on the school committee front, uh, our committee as well has voted unanimously to support favorable action. We look forward to some very helpful input from the consultant team and sharing this with you soon, perhaps as early as fall town meeting. Thank you very much. May we have a recommendation from the finance committee, uh, Ms. Soto. Ms. Soto. This finance committee voted uh, in favor of article 10. Um, we think it sounds like a good plan is going to give us a lot better insight into what improvements are going to be need to be made at Morocco um, over the next, you know, five to ten years. 
Further on the question, under Article 10. Under Article 10, which is a majority vote, the motion comes as set forth on page 18 of the motion booklet. Food and second to the $30,000 be appropriate. All is more particularly set forth in the language before you on page 18. The ballot will be open for 45 seconds. Majority vote required. All those in favor, please go to your voter screen to vote yes. Opposed, vote no. Ballot is closed on article number 10, motion majority vote required. 132 having voted in the affirmative, four in the negative, one abstention, the motion passes. This brings us to the end of this evening at 10.58 p.m. We will recess the meeting until Thursday, June 11th at 7.30 p.m. Um, we have the budget to get through, but for the most part, I think we've done almost all of our hard things um, through this. I really appreciate everybody's help this evening. Um, a procedural reminder, those of you on the finance committee, if you could return to your Zoom meeting so that you can adjourn and any other committees who have uh, existing meetings going on, if you could return to those to adjourn. Otherwise, we will stand in recess until Thursday, June 11th at 7.30 p.m. The meeting will continue in its existing remote function. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good evening, everybody. Oh, hang on. Got a bad echo in here. Good evening, everybody. Oh, we need to cut the speaker in here because I sound like I'm in a canyon. <laughs> Stand by. Bear with us for a moment here while we get some uh, audio fixing. For those of you just tuning in, we will have a town meeting wrap up here. No, still. Oh, can't. Folks, stay with us. Got a couple little technical glitches here.
speaker. Oops. Guess not. <laughs> okay. All right. Are we set? Yeah. Very good. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alan Iden, uh, coming to you live from the Windcam studio and a very, very different Winchester Spring Town Meeting. Um, let's, if you want to bear with me, we can recap what has happened this evening in a marathon session that just wrapped up. Um, again, this is a virtual town meeting. Uh, it was held here, as you were probably, if you were watching earlier, here at the Windcam Studios. Uh, the moderator said one, at 7.30, 144 town meeting members were logged in via Zoom. Uh, again, this is being held live here. Uh, in his opening remarks, he said the seven uh, Winchester residents have lost their lives to uh, COVID-19. Um, and he said, we are in the middle of a public health and moral emergencies. Uh, and we need to take, in his words, need to take concrete actions. And then we had a moment of silence for victims of racism and of COVID-19. He ended his opening remarks with congratulations to the uh, Winchester High School graduates and any other graduates from town of colleges that uh, were unable to have their normal graduation ceremonies. So we moved on to something kind of different there. We had what we called a consent agenda, which we haven't done before. So we were off to a good start because we had 12 articles uh, in which no debate was expected. Um, and there was one vote taken on those articles. Um, two of them were indefinitely postponed. Article 3, which was related to zoning height changes in uh, North Main Street, and uh, Article 4 on voting technology, those were both indefinitely postponed by the makers. Um, the uh, articles that were covered under this consent agenda were Article 1 for town reports, which we normally hear from all the town boards. Uh, Article 7, a supplemental fund transfer. Article 8, uh, accessing, uh, appropriating cable access funds to us here at Wincam. Article 12, uh, $600,000 for lead water line replacements. Article 13, $64,000 to the building stabilization fund and $63,000 to capital sta stabilization fund from surpluses. Article 18, uh, was a $30,000 replacement of a boiler at Morocco School. Article 19 uh, handled the revolving funds for the archival center, energy use funds, uh, board of health clinics, grass fields, synthetic fields, and historical commission uh, revolving funds. Article 20 was to authorize short-term borrowing. Article 21 uh, accepts state highway funds. Article 22 for $350,000 for other post-employment benefits. So those were taken as one vote, and that vote passed. We then moved on to Article 2, uh, which, uh, again, we saw some several video presentations this evening. Um, this was to add one property to the Rangeley Park Historical District. That was an uh, application by the owner. That was passed. Um, we moved on to Article 5, which was uh, to allow the selectmen to grant temporary and permanent easements to the MBTA for the upcoming reconstruction of the Winchester train station. Some of them temporary during the construction period, some of them permanent for relocation of ramps and staircases. Um, this had to be re, uh, re-voted because these easements, the uh, easements were granted last year. Uh, but a lot of the planning, uh, the plans have substantially changed. There was a lot of public input on this. So um, they, uh, they needed a new vote. Town needed a new vote to authorize the selectmen. We heard from the, our town council and from the town engineer, Beth Rudolph. Um, and that passed by 156 to 4. So then we moved on. We, uh, there was a point of order uh, by a town meeting member to take Article 23 uh, out of order, moved directly to Article 23, which was the report of the Personnel Board. Um, normally not a, um, uh, a very contentious item, but there were 16 motions in this. Um, 
Positions uh, were, uh, according to the Personnel Board report, positions were modified, deleted, and added in the town. Uh, there was a, uh, a patrol officer's contract, and we heard a presentation that uh, there was going to be a 2% raise retroactive uh, to the beginning of this fiscal year, a 4% raise for FY21, and a 6% raise on FY22, mostly to get the officer's pays in line or more in line with comparable communities. Um, there was one concession from the police union, which was to... Um, allow uh, details from other towns and also from uh, retired police officers and, uh, and auxiliary and other special uh, designated people. Be and most of this was because there's an awful going to be an awful lot of projects going on at once in the town, a couple of bridge replacements, train, uh, the train station rebuild, of course, and uh, two, uh, uh, one, but possibly two potential power line. Uh, so that was a concession by the union. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there was also a superior police superior officers contract. There was a fire department contract, which had the same two, four, and six percent raises. Uh, creation of a new deputy chief position. We heard from Lisa Wong, our town manager, um, that the town is able to absorb these raises while still avoiding a new override. Uh, if you recall, the last operating override was projected to last at least four years. Uh, she got, was very passionate about saying that shows the value of our employees. She commended the unions and said that the town was struggling to maintain uh, quality, uh, quality people, uh, quality employees in both the police and fire departments. Um, the Finance Committee said despite these, um, these raises, they do project no additional override requirements until FY24, fiscal year 2024. We heard a dissenting opinion from Selectman Michael Betancourt. Um, he, raises, uh, he raised some sustainable uh, issues, whether the town could sustain these raises. Um, and it's, you, he said we were using the school's money, uh, but he also said that he wanted to avoid any layoffs. Um, so after that, uh, each motion, all 16 motions were voted one at a time. All of them passed. And we were able to move on to Article 6, in a presentation on water and sewer rates. Normally not a very contentious uh, item, but uh, we heard a presentation that's a $1.3 million shortfall this year, and retained earnings in the water and sewer departments have been depleted. Uh, we saw some presentations on how uh, water revenues uh, are uh, inversely proportional to the amount of rainfall. When there's more rain, the revenues go down. When there's less rain, the revenues go up. Um, another contentious item in this was raising the service charge, basically the flat fee, from $5 per quarter to $30 per quarter. Um, the presentation said that the average user will see about a $36 a quarter increase uh, per quarter, um, and a 12, it, it, as a result of a 12% increase in rates. That article was passed, 166 to 34. Article, we moved on to Article 9, uh, which you may have just seen, uh, Lynch School Feasibility Study. Lynch School was built, the Lynch Elementary School was built in 1961 as a junior high school. Um, pretty much desperately in need of replacement, um, this article was appropriating $1.5 million for a feasibility study. That feasibility study is needed to apply to the state for um, uh, assistance from the Mass School Building Authority as we got from Vincent Owen and we got from the Winchester High School. Um, the, uh, the presentation uh, by Chris Nixon from the school committee said that $32 million would be needed to keep Lynch School going if it isn't replaced in the next five years. Um, the uh, town is going to seek funding from the MSBA for Lynch and Morocco together, um, but the town must commit to this $1.5 million uh, study, uh, funding study to be considered, even considered by the MSBA. There is an MSBA vote coming in December of this year, December 2020. And uh, that timetable would, would allow them to approve, if they approve the project, in February of 2022, 
with a occupancy of fall of 2025 for a new Lynch Elementary School. That required a two-thirds vote, uh, and it more than more than passed, 131 to 7. Brought us to the last article of the evening, Article 10, which was $30,000 for engineering consulting services for the Morocco School, Morocco Elementary School, which was built in 1967. And those studies are just to sustain the school for the next eight to 10 years. Um, the, uh, the time, it is substantially newer than, uh, well, not substantially newer, it's, it's newer than the uh, Lynch School. Lynch was built in 1961, Morocco was built in 1967. Um, is in better shape than the Lynch School, but uh, still it needs to be replaced. And we also saw some uh, facts and figures of uh, the growth anticipated and actual growth in school enrollments um, that uh, are straining our elementary schools and our secondary schools too. Uh, so this, this was a $30,000 request uh, just to see what was needed to keep the Morocco School going for the eight to 10 years. Um, before it could potentially be replaced and if it get funded by the Mass School Building Authority. And that again, uh, town meeting approved that by 132 to 4. And it is now 1113 and we're wrapping up for the evening. We'll be back here covering our virtual town meeting again on Thursday night and according to the moderator, hoping to wrap things up at that time. So for all of us here at WinCam, we thank you for your patience in staying here, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday night. For all of us here at WinCam, I'm Alan Iden. Have a good night.